No, I seem to have the wrong form here. What happened? Hmm. Here's another. Yeah. That was it. yeah, thank you very much. Sorry about that. Yes. Welcome to the regular meeting number 14, 2007. We'll start with the roll call by the town clerk. And before we do that, I would like to welcome uh, Ruthie Noble as our new town clerk in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, Chairman McKinney. Here. Uh, Councillor Backer. Present. Councillor Dill. Here. Councillor Lennon. Present. Councillor Lynch. Here. Councillor Rowe. Here. Councillor Swift Kayetta. Here. Okay. And please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, now we'll move on to review of the minutes of meeting number 12, held August 13, 2007, and number 13, held August 27, 2007. Any corrections or amendments to those minutes? I do approval of the minutes of August 13, 2007. We have a second. Second. Okay. Any comments? Stay all in favor? Very good. Okay, next. Okay. okay. How about August? Uh, did you? Um, I'll move approval of the minutes of August 27th. Second. Okay. Any uh, comments? All right. All in favor? Very good. Okay. Now we'll remove. We'll move on to reports and correspondence. And the first piece of correspondence that I would like to bring up is the fact that we got plenty of emails and we appreciate all the input regarding the comprehensive plan and I gather we'll probably get some more input and that's that's good that's why we have the public hearings so for everybody who uh, participated in this and gave us your feedback we really appreciate it and we do take this into consideration as we deliberate on what changes that we may make to the comp plan before we finalize it. Okay. Any other um, reports and correspondence? Marianne. I have one. I um, spent the late afternoon today at the first meeting of the Cumberland County Budget Advisory um, Commission, which I was elected to um, this summer. And um, the news is all good. I can't uh, all bad. I can't say there's any good news at all. Um, the draft budget that we were given for Cumberland County is um, would raise um, county property taxes 8.21 percent, and that would be an increase of 8.21 percent to us. So, as all of you know, um, it's not a number that we, as a council, have control over. I can assure you, I will work very diligently in my role on the county budget committee to see what we can do. Um, but the um, numbers don't look good, and um, it's just another sign of the pressures that we see on our own town budget. So I'll keep you informed. It was just a really introductory meeting today, and uh, we'll be going over the department budgets uh, starting next week. So I'll try and keep you informed, and if you have any questions, don't <coughs> hesitate to uh, give me a call. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Marianne. Any other reports and correspondence? Yeah. Any, anything? Not tonight. <laughs> All right. Very good. Okay, town manager's report. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, I want to uh, welcome, join you in welcoming uh, Ruth Noble as a as a new uh, town clerk. She did begin work today. Uh, so very much a novice at Cape Elizabeth, but, <laughs> but certainly an experienced clerk with uh, her work as the deputy city clerk in Westbrook. And I know she's going to be a fine addition, and we look forward to having her serve with us. I also want to thank uh, Jackie Coy, who has served as our acting town clerk uh, since July 27th. Uh, really did an admirable job. and she'll, she'll be pleased to hear the minutes were all approved uh, without any change uh, when, she, when she hears that this morning, if she wasn't already watching, but really appreciate all the work that, that she's done. I also want to congratulate uh, Officer Nick Rich of the Cape Elizabeth Police Department uh, on uh, 
being named Officer of the Year uh, by Chief Williams. It was, it was a well-deserved recognition, uh, very fine young officer, and really appreciate uh, all the great service that he provides uh, to, to Cape Elizabeth. I also want to congratulate uh, John Swinehart, uh, who was one of the employees recognized at the recent employee recognition uh, for, for his 25 years of service as a dispatcher here in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, John uh, has been a, a great employee for that period of time and uh, continues to serve us and uh, really pleased to uh, have him as, uh, as part of the team. Uh, one other, two other items I did want to mention uh, is we understood the state was, MDOT, Main Department of Transportation, was to do the bids on Spurwink Avenue this month. We haven't heard any news on that, not sure what's going on. Uh, we did open bids on a town project for the, the traffic light at the high school entrance uh, last week. Uh, successful bidder is the, I don't know if the middle, the, the initials A.D. Grover or something Grover out of uh, North Yarmouth, uh, Cumberland ma mailing address, uh, and the bid was within the budget, and uh, that work should be completed sometime in the next six weeks. It should be beginning uh, sometime in the, in the next couple of weeks and be completed uh, in, the, in the next six weeks. Uh, beyond that, Shore Road repair uh, is due to begin the week of September 24th uh, from here to Fort Williams, uh, so that should be a much smoother surface uh, compared to what we have now. So that's the update on issues uh, that may be of interest to citizens. Thank you, Michael. Okay, now we will move on to citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anybody who would like to make a comment on anything that's not on the agenda? Yes, sir. Hi there. Carl Dittrich, 500 Ocean House Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. In Cape Elizabeth, I understand you can uh, rent out your house for a year, a season, a month, or a week to a perfect stranger. Um, and I was wondering why you couldn't rent out a room in your house for a night or two nights. Because I was wondering if the council um, knew how much a room in Cape Elizabeth's main cost, the cheapest room. Any guesses? Would anyone like to guess? Someone just say a guess. Appease me. $500. Yeah. Well, I brought a visual. The cheapest room in Cape Elizabeth it's $413 a night, and it's 96% booked. And I would like to have, I'm on a state road, heavily traveled, I would like to have a bed and breakfast. And I didn't know why the town of Cape Elizabeth does not allow a bed and breakfast when there seems to be a need for it. Um, I don't know if it's part of a comprehensive plan or a zoning change, an ordinance plan, or I don't know what committee or anything. I just know it's not allowed now, and I'd like it to be. Before everything's set in stone with a new plan. Thank you for your uh, comments. We'll uh, take them under advisement. Thank you. All right. Any other uh, citizens that would like to? Make any comments about anything that's not on the agenda this evening? Okay. Now we're going to move on to the public. Yes. Yes, sir. Come on up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my name is Warren Ruth, and I live at 36 Kettle Cove, Maine. Um, I only read what was in the Cape Courier. I did not read the whole thing. So what I say is out of step, you know, pull the trap door and off I'll go. Um, first of all, thank you. I'm sure it's more than a lot of work to try to put that together, and what I read in the synopsis perhaps was too brief. What I didn't see in there would respectfully suggest there be some type of language, either vague or specific, is some encouragement to build green, to encourage the use of alternative power. I know it was in number item number 36 or 39 for the town to use perhaps biodiesel, but what about the high school using wind or solar power? What about encouraging people in Cape Elizabeth to do the same? 
I know that uh, from another experience in South Portland right now, building green is an anathema, but I also know that it's the year 2007 and this is the world we live in and that we should also reflect the urgent need to build green, to look into wind and solar and other types of power. I don't think there really are other feasible types here, but I don't know if there can be specific, specific, excuse me, or vague language to suggest that we as a town, if we are indeed interested in advocating and trying to at least encourage direction like this. I'm sure there's a better way to say that in English, but thank you. Thank you very much. And I think uh, just to clarify you know, or answer your, uh, your concern, we actually have that as one of our town council goals this year. And we have, um, we're in the process of, a, of having the uh, planning board look at alternative energy ordinance, ordinance uh, you know, um, structures, and they're going to get back to the uh, council, and we're, we're forming an alternative energy committee. Will there, we're, we're on board with that. Will there be uh, citizen state uh, advocates, you know, or will that just be an internal process in the town council? Um, we don't know right now, but we're in the process yeah. of moving that forward. I might be interested. And please. Mr. Chairman, if I, if I Go ahead. Sir, I, just so you're aware. Um, Warren. It, I'm sorry. I, That's I, fine. I didn't That's, catch your okay. name when you said it first. Warren. Um, we're in the process of advertising or, or doing interviews for an alternative energy committee. Um, the, I'm chair of the appointments committee. So we are going to be holding interviews later in the month. So I would encourage you to go on the website if you're interested and anybody else who might be interested. So I just wanted to let you know. I, I agree. I think you've got some good ideas there, and we're on it. So. Hey, terrific. Thanks. Okay. Now, are there any other citizens that would like to make comments on any other items that are not on the agenda this evening? And, and by the way, we really do appreciate your comments. and. Um, they are helpful. Give us good feedback. All right, now we're going to move to the public hearing. I now call the public hearing open. And um, anybody who would like to speak regarding the proposed 2007 comprehensive plan is welcome to speak. I'd ask you to go to the podium, state your name and address, and just keep your comments to about three minutes or less if possible. And uh, we'll move forward. So anybody who would like to come up and speak, please do. My name is Ted Darling, and I live at 35 Macaulay Road, and I'm speaking this evening as Vice President of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. The Cape Elizabeth Land Trust's 600-member households are deeply concerned with the impact of the comprehensive plan on strategic land preservation and the maintenance of the rural character of the town. Not coincidentally, the values of our members are shared with the broader Cape Elizabeth community as a whole. In December 2005, the Comprehensive Planning Committee sought to understand the planning priorities of residents in a townwide survey. With resounding cl clarity, the survey confirmed the importance of the natural environment to Cape residents. Specifically, the survey showed that fully 94% of residents listed the natural environment as an important benefit of living in Cape Elizabeth. Of those surveyed, 83% cited protecting and preserving wetlands, ponds and wooded areas as future planning goals, while four out of five residents also cited preserving the town's rural character and protecting farmland. Several sections of the comprehensive plan address these com important community values. Unfortunately, the recommended implementation steps to affirm these goals lack the financial teeth needed to assure their success. Specifically, the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust has identified the following issues and it provided related recommendations to redress the, the uh, current shortcomings in the plan. Implementation step 48 calls for the purchase of land uh, or conservation easements where there is an opportunity to preserve unique or open, uh, significant open space, especially where it can be added to the Greenbelt trail system. 
While this step specifies that the town should purchase land for conservation easements, there is no funding mechanism available to affect such purchases, so that the town will be in a position to make strategic purchases when opportunities present themselves, we suggest adding an implementation step as follows. Evaluate various funding methodologies, including an assessment of the viability and feasibility of a public land bond and its effect on the tax rate to assure permanent protection of unique land parcels in town that define the town's rural community character. Within the next five years, we anticipate many of our treasured land parcels, many of which we take for granted as permanent open space, will present themselves for purchase. In fact, much of the present look and feel of the town derives from parcels that are unprotected. To assure that funding will be available when unique parcels of land present themselves for purchase or conservation easement, we recommend the following implementation step. Secure long-term financing by a land bond budget set-asides, or other proactive methods so that the town is prepared to purchase land or conservation easements as strategic parcels and preservation opportunities are presented to the Council. In a letter sent last week to Council, we've outlined several other suggested changes to the comprehensive plan language that give <coughs> land protection and conservation the weight they deserve. On behalf of our members and the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, I urge you to, to adopt these changes. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Ted. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Barbara? I wonder, if you would, I wonder if you'd like to come up and um, just give an in, a little bit of an overview of what took place and how this got developed. Uh, this is Barbara Schenkel. She was the uh, chairperson of the committee that uh, drafted the comprehensive plan. Thank you, Barbara. Okay. I'm delighted to see all of you here, and because we spent two years working on the plan doesn't mean it can't be better. Right? So we're delighted to have you all here making your recommendations, too. Not everybody's is going to be taken, but some of them I'm sure the Council is going to listen to very carefully and incorporate some of them into the plan. So um, we started in June of 2005, and since then we have met 29 times. Some months we met twice a month, some meetings were three hours, and sometimes we made, and some of the people are here from the committee, we would make 20 decisions a night. We had lots of great discussion. We didn't all always agree. We came from a variety of walks of life. There were 12 members on the committee. Some of us represented uh, committees and boards in the town, and others were on the, on the uh, Comprehensive Plan Committee as residents and business owners in the town. So we had a lot of different kinds of opinions, a lot of ideas, and a lot of things that were important to one of us or several of us that might not have been as important to others. And we all always listened to each other. As Ted said, we started out by having a survey, a telephone survey, that was statistically significant. In addition to that, we, we tried as hard as we could to involve the public. And you're here tonight as part of involving the public. But that's from the council. That wasn't from us. Um, we did hold three public hearings. We put everything we did on the town website. Every single um, chapter that we wrote was, uh, was reduced to a, a review of it in the, the Cape Courier. Um, we, see I'm trying to think, I probably missed one or two things here, and I forgot my glasses, so I can't say. Oh, do you want my, <laughs> um, and we came up with 88 recommendations, a variety, many, many goals. Well, let me back up a little bit. One of the first things we also did was to meet with the state planning office, a representative from the state planning office, because if our plan does not meet their guidelines, we might as well forget it. So we got their guidelines and we tried to uh, follow them as closely as we could. They don't tell you what to do, they just tell you areas that you have to cover. Uh, if there were things that were very important in terms of the state, we did discuss them and we either incorporated them or perhaps sometimes we didn't, um, depending upon what the committee decided. The majority rule was always the way we went. And when, when it was only a one-vote decision, we would try to discuss it even further and come up with a, a broader consensus. But we did move on. 
um, 88 implementation steps, which we then took and decided whether they should be short-term, long-term, or continuing. Short-term meant within three years it has to be implemented. Long-term was longer than that. The plan goes out to about the year 2020. And as a last thing, and I don't have a, a copy of it, um, we contacted a, a, an art teacher at the high school, and we, here it is, and there was a little contest held at the high school, and Sarah DeFusco, she was selected. She was the young woman. We felt she captured Cape Elizabeth in this image. what we did. If anybody has a quick question, fine. If not, I'll sit down and listen to you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Paul, I just wonder um, if we could introduce, there are a number of members of the comp plan committee oh, here, and they work so hard. Maybe, Barbara, I thought you could introduce them, or? Okay. Maybe if they all stood and then. Uh, John Herrick is right here, and John School board rep, too. Elaine, yes. Elaine Maloney. Elaine Maloney was a school board rep. Maloney. And there were two other, Jay Chapman was on the zoning board. board. And Bob Dodd. And Bob Dodd was another citizen. citizen. We were all citizens. Yes. Did I miss anybody? No, I think you got everyone there. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Barbara. You're welcome. As everyone can see, this was a very um, lengthy process, two years in the making, 29 meetings, very challenging. Oh, I'd like to say one more thing. Yes, ma'am. We could have done it without worrying about exactly. our council. <laughs> Let me tell you, we really could have done it without her. She worked quite a few people. She was the first person to come to the council. We all know her great benefits. And then Mar Mary Beth Richardson was another member of and your Mary team. Beth um, yeah, Maureen O'Meara, our town planner, who is um, also has been elected by her peers to be the president of the Maine Planning, uh, Planners Association, which is a pretty great honor. Um, she was the staff person that uh, directed, you know, the um, committee and I, I should say assisted the committee in going in the right direction, <laughs> correct? And uh, I think these maps some represent a lot of the, the work that was done, right? So, uh, very, very out outstanding job. I was going to say comprehensive <laughs> job, but it sounds like done. <laughs> but it really was. It's, it's a very impressive document. Now, you know, the, the way the process works is we get your input. You know, you know we have the, the plan. We get the input from the public. We tweak the plan as needed. And then we, you know, come up with a final version. So we do appreciate all of your comments and all of your input because it does matter. It's not a perfect document, like Barbara said, but it sure is a darn good one, and it was a, a great effort. Does anybody else, uh, would anybody else like to make any comments about the comp plan or anything in it? Please. The glass is on. Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Greg Olsenauer and the 25 Kildeer Road, and I'm running for town councilor. Uh, thank you guys. You guys did a great job putting together a comprehensive plan, and the committee you put together it was remarkable. I looked at it today 
for the last couple of weeks, and it's, it's really a well-written plan. I do have a couple concerns about that. Um, in regard to the surveys that came out, uh, in regard to uh, gentleman for SELT mentioned about 94% valued natural environment, 83% uh, value protecting and preserving wetlands, ponds, and wooded areas, and 80% preserving the town's rural character. Reviewing the plan, I was saddened to see many issues that really looked more or less not preserving the town's character, preserving the wetlands. It was more pro development. For instance, number one, allow RP1 250 feet buffer to reduce to, to 100 feet in the BA and BB districts. Number 13, increase the permit, permitted density of multifamily housing units. Number 14, reviewing the minimum lot size. Number 82, eliminate the cap of the number of units per building per multiplex development. Number 83, reduce the minimum lot size required for multiplex housing in RL, RC district. To me, that means it's an open hand book for development. Um, I am against, I'm for development in a very conservative way, but there's got to be restrictions. Uh, in regard to Trout Brook, the bulk of the development is in the RC and RB district. What I like to know is who decided that this development is going to be in the RC and RB districts? Was there a vote? Why is there a development going on in the first place? Uh, I mean, who decided this? Um, the watershed that's being currently being um, proposed there or the 60, I heard 60, heard 45, heard 50, unit condo project that's going in there is in a watershed area that's very important to the Trout Brook. It's an impaired by the state of Maine. Um, you destroy a wetland, you destroy a watershed, it's gone forever. Um, you know, the developers proposing um, only 55 year old and older to go in there. Uh, you, you gotta look at the big picture is when you have uh, a 60 unit condo complex going in there, and you have families that go in there with kids. And you got to think of the long-term picture. Sure, we have more increases in taxes. We have more taxes. We have more money coming in toward us, which is great. But the bad thing is you have a lot of services. You have the police. You have the firemen. You have to hire more teachers. You got to get more books. So there's possibly a possible tax increase. SELT recommended possibly is doing a survey, which I recommend me the town council to consider. There's a survey to consider development to what taxes, development, putting in these six units or whatever, compared to what, uh, to, not to raise taxes when in regard to more people coming into a particular area, more houses, more students, etc. cetera. Um, so that's, you know, more building, more, you know, more, you know, less, less uh, services, more, I mean, more services, more taxes. And the third point, third point is on number I 25 is pr promote connectivity. I saw that and I re recall there was a vote uh, about a year ago or six months ago about not doing that. And I see that in part of the plan. So I'm very concerned about that. We voted on that. We voted strongly 60 to 40 percent against it. And it's in the plan. So that's what I have to say. But anyhow, other than that, the work has been great. You guys did a great job, all you guys. But that's my concern. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Please. Uh, D, Wilson, I Adi, could, could I ask you to please come up here? It's really hard to hear. I just really wanted to simply say that I had the opportunity to go to um, many, not all, but many of the comp plan committee meetings, and I just thought they did a great job. Um, my interest may be a little bit different than the one the people that are here, um, but. Overall, I listened to all the arguments and support for all the different areas of the plan, and I just think it, it was really well thought out and um, a great document, and that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Okay, do we have other folks? Please. Uh, Dave Clay, Three Misty Lane. Um, the public opinion survey conducted prior to the development of the draft comprehensive plan gave the highest priorities to protecting and preserving wetlands, ponds, and wooded areas, preserving the town's rural character, and protecting farmland. Yet the draft recommendations include 
increasing density and reducing minimum lot sizes by 50 percent or more, increasing the size of the current BA district, reducing neighborhood setback requirements and creating new business districts, eliminating minimum lot sizes and building height limitations for multiplex units. In exchange, the new plan offers few new changes or additions to the old plan that serve to accomplish the primary goals at set, as set forth in the survey. For example, the most notable and publicized change, an increase in open space from 40% to 45% in the RB district, if fully implemented, would only preserve an additional 26 acres of land while allowing up to 350 additional homes to be built. This is clearly not a reasonable or balanced trade-off. In addition, the proposed 50% increase in density in the RB district would also result in urban style lot sizes of about 8,000 square feet, the same size as is typical in downtown Portland. Also troubling are the recommendations to reduce or eliminate minimum lot sizes, allow an increase in the number of units per building, and remove height restrictions for multiplex units. This would open up more land for development by making land that was previously not suitable under the old restrictions more attractive under the new, especially areas adjacent to or near sensitive wetlands and watersheds. The density levels should remain where they are now, especially since future anticipated growth could be accommodated at these current levels. Since home demand and prices have leveled off and are actually falling, there is li also little reason to create bonus densities to encourage multiplex housing. These units are less expensive to build any, anyway, and demand should be determined by the market and not encouraged by the town's ordinances. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Mr. Yes, Chairman, David. could we ask that people spell their last name before they start to speak, please. Certainly. Okay. I'm Richard Fontana, F-O-N-T-A-N-A, -A, 14 Valley Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. And I have to say, I agree with the men and disagree with the women, but that's my starting joke. But it's basically true. I think the town plans uh, just completely lacks any planning for what the people of Cape Elizabeth want. Um, everyone has said what you've already heard, which we want the open spaces, and we want the, the atmosphere we have now. The town plan doesn't seem to plan for the end. I think we can see that the available tracks are in large blocks with farms, and the end is coming. When those are done and sold, we won't have the spaces that we see today. I think the plan needs to look at what do we want the end to look like? Should it look a lot like it does today, or should it look like Somerville, Mass., Arlington, Mass., Lexington, Mass., Lincoln, Mass. I don't know if you're familiar with those areas, but I lived there a while. And I'm sure that the people who live here now and said what they said in that survey would not be happy. And Somerville, Mass., Lexington, Mass., Link or Arlington, Mass. would probably be okay in Lincoln, Mass. So I think we should plan for what we want, and we should try to do it in this plan. And I don't think we have, have gotten there yet. Um, I sound a little severe, but I'll give you my... Uh, my basic reaction when I first read it. I think there are some flawed assumptions in the plan as well. There seem to be a lot of things where if we allow development in area X, RB, whatever, it will reduce development in an area that we didn't want development. But I don't think that's the way the market works in Cape Elizabeth. Any lot that becomes available here is going to be a desirable lot for developer because for the same amount of work on a house, you'll get to sell the house for more. You might pay a little more for the lot, but you can sell the house for a lot more. Any space that comes up for sale is going to be developed. So what are we going to do to plan ahead and say, we don't want this space developed? I don't think allowing development will get us there, and I don't think this plan gets us where we want to be in the long run. So I think we need to have a plan a lot like the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust has proposed. Um, we need to have some bonds. We need to know whether it's cheaper to buy the land and set it aside than it is have it developed, if you do some math and look at our 71% education rate, and look at the fact that most of the houses proposed will be attractive to people with kids, look at the fact that my neighbor says, oh yeah, as soon as our kids are out of college, I'm going to, out of high school, 
we're moving to Scarborough. Um, I think we should be pretty aware of the situation we could be getting ourselves into where we're losing, you know, I'll use a mechanical engineering analogy, we're losing $2 per widget. Let's make more widgets. It doesn't make sense when you do the math. So um, I think that we need to plan to end development. In other words, any lot that comes up for sale is something we want rather than any lot that comes up for sale can be developed. So I guess that's my conclusion. There's, I've written a letter to the town uh, councilors, and they should, hopefully we'll get a chance to read it. Many of them have. And I, I will be happy to send it to anyone else who's interested. But my main thing I think we should all think about going forward is, will this get us where we want to be when all the land in Cape Elizabeth has been sold and developed? And I really think it's very, very far away from where we want to be. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you for your comments. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just, we've had a number of folks come in and set up chairs in the back. And we have to maintain a fire exit in a, in a hall of public assembly. And I notice people squeezing through to get there. We have a whole front row available here. We have other chairs. If folks could please clear the aisles. Uh, sounds like the old political conventions. You know, we, we just can't have, we need the middle aisle open, and we need about six feet across the back and six feet to go out the door. So thank you. Okay, um, who would like to speak next? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Penny Jordan, uh, Jordan's Farm on Wells Road in Cape Elizabeth. And um, I read the comprehensive plan, and uh, I know I've, I've spoken before you uh, previously. And we continually hear about preserving farmland in Cape Elizabeth. And uh, preserving farmland is one thing. There's also preserving farms. And preserving a farm means preserving business. And a business to be successful must be profitable and has to maintain a profit year after year after year after year. And that's, and that's what we try to do every season at uh, Jordan's Farm. And I know that the other farms in the area are attempting to do the same thing. But uh, each year it becomes more and more difficult because we play within constraints that are uh, established through zoning or through other mechanisms within the town. So what I want to do is express to you the importance of forming a group if we truly, truly believe that we want to preserve farmland and farming in Cape Elizabeth, then we need to pull together a group of people that allows us to create a construct that allows farms to diversify in some way. And I'm not saying what that is, because I really believe it's the farmers and the citizens who need to come together, and they need to state, this is how we want farming to be done within our town. I know, um, as a member of Farms for the Future at the state level, there's a lot of work that has been done at the state level and across other organizations in order to identify what farms need to do to remain profitable and what are some of the things that they can do that, that remain within the constructs of farming. There's a season and you stay within that season, but within that season you have to do different things. You have to do business differently. We live in a grab-and-go society. You can no longer have a farm stand that just markets what you grow. You have to create value-added propositions. And I think you hear that. I mean, we're all business people. You hear that every day. You have to have value-added propositions. And farmers are business people, and they're business people first, but they're also stewards of the land and you balance that day after day after day. And all I am asking is that the council consider very, very seriously the importance of forming a group of farmers and citizens to define how they want the business of farming to be performed in this community from this point forward. And if we don't do it fairly soon, I mean, you're going to start losing the farms because we aren't making money. You don't make money selling lettuce for $1.50 a head. You make money 
by taking that head of lettuce and creating something else out of it. And it's all about value added. So all I'm doing is I, I am very serious when I say that you need to think about this next step very seriously. It aligns perfectly with a comprehensive plan. I mean, it's part of the implementation. It will be part of the framework for the next 10 to 15 years. Um, and I truly feel that if people in the town, which we keep getting the feedback, people in the town truly believe farming is part of the uh, character of this town, we could pull a group together with little or no impact on budget. We have extremely talented people in this town who can come forward, facilitate a team of people. Research has been done at a state level and at a regional level. We can draw from work that's already been done. And I truly believe that with the right group, you could do this with little or no impact on the budget. But if we don't do it and we don't do it soon, then you're, you're, going to lose, you're going to lose more farms. You may end up with farm land with no farmers working it. So what is, then it's called open space. So do you want farms or do you want open space? And that's the question that I think we truly need to answer. And if we want farms, then we need to put a group together to, to make that happen. And this is a, there's no better way to do it than aligning it with the comprehensive plan. Thank you, Penny. Yep. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, um, if I may, um, for Penny Jordan, uh, Penny, I'm sure you know that later in our agenda, we have the agricultural profile agenda item. Yes. Just wanted to make sure that you knew that separate item was on there and that you would stay for it. I'm Larry Clough, C-L-O-U-G-H, 57 Stony Brook. I'm president of the Cape Land Trust. I'm not really here tonight to speak on their behalf. It's more as somebody who's been involved in town land use matters for the last 30, 30 years. I was on the last comprehensive plan commission that took two and a half years to go through. And prior to that, I served on the, the Cape Zoning Board, including two terms as chairman. I'm also an attorney who gets involved a lot in real estate matters, uh, both for lenders and developers. And, I've just finished the project in Scarborough, which was the state planning's office for the poster child for development, which is the Great American Neighborhood. And that's sort of a couple broad brush comments. For you know, the Capes existed for over 400 years, and probably for most of that, the preservation we've seen was by accident and by the graciousness of you know families such as the Jordans and other people who farmed. And you know, Ledge, and I remember the, all the sewer battles that went on in the town, which was really a uh, this quiet way of uh, having land preserved, but things have really changed. Land values have gotten so tremendous that you know the things that used to inhibit development don't anymore because the values are just so tremendous. You can put a sewer in or overcome ledge, so we're really dependent on the goodwill and uh, respect for heritage that some of our existing landowners have. And we've changed to an era where it really takes money to preserve land. We can't ask farmers to. You know, graciously give up their own 401k, I think is one way of characterizing it, I've heard, for the benefit of all citizens. And really, you know, the town as a whole needs to take the initiative. And unfortunately, in, in land matters, uh, time is an important factor. It's hard to ask people to wait a year or a year and a half to put a project together. The land trust, myself, was involved heavily in the Jordan farm project, and that involved a sort of unique partnership between the state and federal government and actually, we were the first entity in the nation that had the two different programs come together as it did. And it just takes a long time. So I think one thing that's important for the town is to be prepared to dedicate the, those financial resources. There are a lot of hidden costs of development. I think one speaker mentioned education. There have been a variety of studies done elsewhere in the greater Portland area. And there's a, a lot of costs to development that other taxpayers end up paying. And those costs wouldn't be there if that land remained preserved. You know, there's a sense in some of the comments I've heard that maybe Cape Elizabeth has done enough for development. We have a certain amount of open space land, but there's still a lot of land in this town that's undeveloped really by the grace of the owners. And 
over the next decade or multiple decades. We're in sort of a temporary pause right now. But unless the town really steps up and makes an affirmative commitment to do something, it will be lost. You know, it may not be Lexington or Medford, but it will disappear. And you know, right now in the present comprehensive plan, we're looking at designating you know, a large tract of farmland as you know, high growth area. You know, is that really the best policy for the town? I think the town has to recommend that this, this document is not just another blue ribbon commission that's going to be put up on the shelf. This will be legally binding on the town in terms of future zoning. The town will be compelled uh, to amend its zoning ordinance to, to match what's in the comprehensive plan. So it's, it's not a decision that I think the council should feel they have to rush into you know, in a week or a month. I think it's, it's very important to get this right. Uh, we only get a sporadic shot at this, and this is, this is the time to do it. It's, it's really a time to reflect on where we're going to drive the bus over the next couple of decades. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. My name is Tom Egan. I live at EGAN. I live at 41 Hannaford Cove Road. Uh, I read the uh, plan document back in June or July, and then today I spent some time in the basement of the Thomas Memorial Library rereading it along with the 1993 plan and the 1980 plan, just to get some feel for how similar or different are the approaches to planning uh, over the last 27 years. And it is remarkable how the issues that the town council tried to deal with in 1980 are still with us. And there's one page that I'd refer you to if you have the, the inclination or the time to read it, there's one page in the 1980 plan that refers to affordable housing. And the moral necessity, the moral impetus that drives zoning and planning to enable people who come from diverse social and economic backgrounds to come to our town and enhance our experience and our children's experience here. So, that, it's a very sensitively written letter. Apparently, however, from reading this plan, we don't think that we've addressed affordable housing adequately in Cape Elizabeth. And one of the takeaways that I have from this document is that a lot of time and effort and attention is spent on increasing the number of multiplex housing facilities or units, affordable housing units, increasing density to allow affordable housing and so on. And so the overall impression is, is that we're relaxing development standards to enable people to come here who might not otherwise do so. And I think that's a laudable goal, but I have a criticism about it in particular Number 19, uh, specifically, the plan asks the town to create an affordable housing overlay district that permits a mixed market rate uh, and low income affordable housing at a density greater than the existing underlying zoning. And to me, that's, to me, that's an enclave. And so if you, if you want to induce affordable housing, I I, I urge you not to put it in one little spot. I think if there are going to be subdivisions, if there's going to be a 60 unit condominium project somewhere, I mean, wow, you could trade off uh, some gains there, I would assume, uh, to provide more affordable uh, housing units. And I see in the plan that there's, I think it's 10% of uh, development units in a subdivision are by law required to be uh, affordable, maybe we could increase that number. Uh, I'm just suggesting that we disperse affordable housing other than creating a single uh, overlay district. Another, another issue I have with the plan is that there seem to be some drivers for reducing the, uh, the protections against, uh, the protections against overdevelopment. And those drivers seem to be, one is affordable housing, 
The other is a, a standard that is set by the Greater, Pounce, uh, Greater Portland Council of Governments that uh, refers to 476 new housing units that, quote, will be needed in Cape Elizabeth by 2020 to accommodate its projected uh, increase in population of 943 residents, including, and then they specify 431 single family houses and 45 rental units. How Greater Portland Council of Governments can tell us what we need is beyond me. I just, you know, they're projecting the growth in population and then they say, well, if you want to house that need, that, that desire, well, then you build these 478 units. But we can say how many units that we would like to have built here. So I don't think we need a third party telling us what the standard should be. Um, lastly, uh, with respect to open space preservation, I have an idea, and I don't, I don't know whether it would work, but there should be a way to help induce wealthy persons to buy uh, open space land and donate it to either the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust or the Nature Conservancy or maybe, you know, some of the, the, the Island Institute or something, or perhaps the town. And I'm thinking specifically of tax, uh, tax uh, uh, grants or tax breaks. So for example, if somebody, a wealthy person who lives on Shore Road was uh, interested in buying some open space land and donating it, they would get a tax deduction obviously from the federal government and from the state government on their income tax. But what if Cape Elizabeth were to give them a property tax break? In that way, you uh, you're not paying dollar for dollar or even anywhere near what it would cost you to buy the land, the town, with a bond or anything, or you know, your, your cash, uh, regular cash flow annually, but you would be inducing this private citizen to, to do the same thing. And I think somebody should look into the, the possibility of using property tax abatements to subsidize the purchase of land by a private citizen and a contribution then to a third party entity such as the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. That's those are my observations and that recommendation. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for all your research. Who would like to uh, go next? Anybody? Any more comments? Yes, ma'am. I'm not here defending anything. I'm Barbara Schenkel, um, <clears throat> 32 Belfield Road. And, but I just would like to correct a, what might be a misconception at this point. We had to put the state projections into the plan. But if you read further in the plan, you'll find that we actually used Cape Elizabeth's building permits to determine the number of units that might conceivably be built over the next 13 years. And it was 321, I believe, is that correct? 330. And I want to tell everybody that this year there were only 10 new homes built in Cape Elizabeth. Is that not correct? It so eight between 10 and 11. 10 and 11. <laughs> but when, when we talked about it, we said, why do we even need this verbiage in the plan? Well, because the state might get upset if their verbiage wasn't in it, but then we looked at it a very different way. And if you read all the implementation steps we, and the discussion before them, you'll see we used our own numbers. And I would just like to, sometimes, you know, if, if you haven't been involved in the whole process, and you just read a piece of it, it looks pretty bad or not to someone's liking. And it isn't really exactly what we said in the plan. We did base the plan on the 330 units. So thank you. Thank you, Barbara. I'd also like to clarify one other um, point that, that Tom made, and that is that um, 
and being the president of Greater Portland Council of Governments right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the GPCOG does not mandate anything to any of the member communities. It does serve as a uh, tool, if you will, and a resource for the member communities. And it does help with statistical data, but it really doesn't have anything to do with what the town actually does, just so you know. It's the state planning office by state law that mandates um, every town must plan for a certain amount of development, its share of the state's development. And the Comprehensive Plan Committee felt that the state planning office estimate, which was funneled through COG, but exactly. was not COG, <laughs> they just funneled us the information, um, was inappropriate, high, was not accurate. So as Barbara Schenkel said, uh, the committee decided to decrease that based on what the committee felt was much better information, more locally based. Thank you very much for the clarification, Ann. Um, it, it, would anyone else like to make some comments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll ask you to come over here, please. Rick Fontana, 14 Valley Road, FONT. Oh, uh, again. Um, we, we had 10 or 11 homes apparently built, but we're in one of the worst economic environments for building new houses. We haven't had a major tract sold like Maxwell's or Jordan's or Sprague land. Um, I think we have to plan, a 20-year plan has to plan for economic cycles, booms and busts. The market isn't perfect and the industry overbuilds historically. Um, so I think that assuming that last year or the last couple of years would not be a good assumption. We have to plan for the lands coming available to become available. And also I think most people in the town would agree that the state really has no business dictating uh, what we like, would like our town to be and what our growth rate should be. Now, they, there may be legal reasons where uh, we have to deal with that situation, but I suggest we all somehow call our representatives and push back on that and say uh, the country's not based on that kind of uh, doctrine. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's um, just a point of clarification there. there. There are issues, there are state mandates and rules that we have to abide by but we have room to plan within those mandates. And that's, that's the key point. Um, and what we're trying to do, and what the Comprehensive Planning Committee has um, worked hard to accomplish, is to find that balance of some development of, while maintaining the rural character of the town. And just a couple of points that I think are important to note. One is that the town does own 2,000 acres. Roughly 2,000 acres, Mike? That might include a little bit of the state park too, but it's about 2,000 acres of space. And we're not developing that land. And then the um, land trust has protected around 600 acres. So right there, there's tw about 2,600 acres that are in some kind of protective nature. So just uh, so people are aware, there is no plan to just put houses up everywhere you see an open piece of land in Cape Elizabeth. Not at all not by any stretch of the imagination. So what I would like to do now is... Uh, yeah. Any, is anybody else... Would anybody else like to make a comment? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Carol Hubbard from 14 Valley Road. Would you please spell your name? H-U-B-B-A-R-D. Um, a lot of great points have been making and made, and thank you very much for listening to all of us. But I'd like to make a perhaps somewhat related comment that's coming from a more primal level of self-preservation. Um, there's been mention of a large development that's going in on Eastman Road, and um, that's a lovely semi-rural road at the present time, and I think the development will probably at least triple the population on that road, and there's many people that run walk their dogs. This morning I saw someone walking their horse on that road. And I have real concerns about safety. And I think this also perhaps ties into the cost of development to the town. And there may be regulations or provisions for doing things like building sidewalks. But I would ask you guys, when we're considering this overall development issue, to consider the safety of the residents with development and think about things like sidewalks and 
especially in a road like that, which I know there have been fatalities there, of, at least of pets. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, once again, it, um, are there any <clears throat> other parties that would like to make a comment or two regarding the comprehensive plan? Okay, I hear none. The public hearing for the comp plan is now closed, and we will move on to the items on the agenda. Okay, item um, number 134. I, guess, yes. I, I think we should um, move to uh, table this. We, we don't have a motion. Right, that's where we're Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I thought you were go ahead. I do moving want on. No, go ahead, um, right. There's been a lot of great discussions tonight, and I know that all of us are still thinking about it, and I see a number of people here who wrote to us um, that didn't speak, but we have read all your letters. And so I would move um, that we table this. Um, I, I'm not even sure October is, I mean, we can always retable it, but I think it may take a couple of months to um, work through all these issues. So um, we need a date to table it too, right? Usually good. I don't want to table it indefinitely. So. I think if we go with October, you're, you're right, Marianne, if we feel at that time we want to. More work. Okay. Good. So um, in order for us to have another workshop on it, and we've had three workshops, um, and there's already been a number of changes. Um, I would table it, move to table it to the October 10th regular um, meeting of the council. You want to continue that motion with the rest? Um, at which, w what's left to continue well, I, on the I motion? Well, I guess I can go on about the workshop. Just yeah. Second. Oh, and, and a move to have a workshop on September 17th? Very good. Okay. Thank you. We have a second. Second. Cynthia, any uh, discussion? No discussion. Okay. All in favor? All there is no discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. We will move on to the next public hearing. Uh, this is regarding stormwater improvement fee. And um, anybody who doesn't want to stay, I'll, I'll wait a moment if you want to exit. So it won't be disruptive. Thank you very much for your presence. I, I would like to. I was going to ask. Uh, Maureen, on the on the stormwater improvement fee, as we introduce it, I'd like you to uh, talk about that. Just while Maureen's coming up, just for the council, the, the copies that you got a month ago had all the pages. The copies that you got this month, page two and page four was missing, and it's it's back there again in, in the first slide. Uh, it was passed out at the beginning, but you. Who's signing for copying? There's a new one kicking around. <laughs> Okay. Same one you <laughs> the next item is the uh, public hearing on the stormwater storm improvement fee, and I've asked uh, Maureen O'Meara, our town planner, to give us an introduction to explain this issue before we go to the uh, public hearing. Okay. Um, there's actually two different fees that the council is um, having a public hearing on tonight, and the first one is actually not really a fee, but a program that would make a fee possible. Um, Trout Brook, and I've got the map here, is um, the watershed of Trout Brook, which also includes Kimball Brook, which is a tributary, is this area right here. And as you can see, about half of it is located in South Portland, and about half of it is located in Cape Elizabeth. And when the state's new stormwater rules took effect last year, they also imposed brand new urban impaired watershed standards. And Trout Brook is an urban impaired watershed. The reason it's an urban impaired watershed is it's uh, classified class C in South Portland, class B in Cape Elizabeth, and the available data right now that has tested the quality of the waters of Trout Brook shows that it's not meeting the classification in either community. So it automatically is classified as an urban impaired watershed. And I mean, without getting into detail about that, what that means, uh, and that's in the DEP rule, and I'd rather not speak for the DEP. 
What it means is if any development happens in any part of this watershed that's large enough to trigger the state's site location of development law, then the urban impaired watershed standards will also be triggered. And basically what those standards require is that you will have to mitigate any impact you have on the watershed. And by mitigate, Usually you're pulling back impervious surface or you're finding an area of the watershed that's degraded and you go in there and you fix it. Uh, it there's a, you know, a whole range of things that can happen. Uh, in South Portland, it's kind of an interesting situation because being an urban area, they have a lot of their watershed that's already developed. So there are lots of opportunities generally in urban impaired watersheds where you could go and redevelop an existing area. You could take out the old Kmart and put in a new Coles and peel up some of the parking and improve some of the way you're treating stormwater and you can meet the standards. Uh, but in Cape Elizabeth, a lot of the watershed really is not developed. Uh, we do have some very compact neighborhoods off of Mitchell Road and off of Route 77, but for the most part, it's not developed. And what that means is when any development comes in, one, it's gonna, they're going to trigger the standards if they're large enough. And two, it's going to be a little challenging to find a mitigation project. Well, the state does allow another approach. They do allow communities to adopt what they call community fee utilization programs, where you come up with a list of projects that uh, you would be willing to do in the watershed. The state decides those projects would actually improve the watershed. And then instead of having to take a project and do it, a developer would have the option of paying a fee into a fund for the watershed. And once you have sufficient money in the account, you can start working on the projects that you've identified are appropriate. Um, it's, it's advantageous because the fee is predictable. You can go in, you can calculate it, and you know what you have to do. Um, if you have a degraded area on the site that you're developing, you're probably going to fix that degraded area instead of paying a fee. But in Cape Elizabeth, where most of it's not developed, that option is really not as easily obtained. So the payment of the fee is a lot easier. Um, the fee has already been established by the state. Towns don't have the authority to establish how much that fee amount would be. Uh, the reason that this has been brought to the council for consideration is that uh, while this is a, a laudable opportunity to work on the Trout Brook watershed, it tends to work against the town's land use policies that guide growth into the areas that you have decided growth can be best accommodated. You've identified the RC district, which is this orange area here, as an area that's good for infill development. It already has public water, public sewer, road network available. You further identified these, or these yellow areas as potential growth areas. And if you, you can easily see that you've got a decent amount of your infill area and a decent amount of your growth area in the Trout Brook watershed. What that means is anyone who develops in here and triggers that site location permit is looking at more work and or more money. And those two things can be a disincentive to develop in those areas. They can develop here instead of developing here and avoid the fee. And it works against your land use policies. It creates a disincentive to go where you said you wanted them to go. Instead of going here, they can go down here. Um, and so if you establish this fee program, you create one less level of disincentive because you've made it easier for a developer to at least predict what the impact is going to be. So that's the one thing, that's the Trout Brook fee. But then you still have that problem of this working against directing growth where you said it would work. So the other recommendation for you to consider is looking at taking the fee that would normally apply just here and making it apply everywhere in town so that any development that happened here would be paying a fee into the Trout Brook account and it would have to be spent on projects that have been approved by the DEP anywhere in the watershed, K4 South Portland. And then any project outside of the watershed in the town of Cape Elizabeth that triggered the site location of development law again under the state review would pay the same fee using the state fee schedule, only that money would go into the stormwater fee account 
and the town of Cape Elizabeth would decide how that money would be spent, and I'm assuming since you're calling it a stormwater fee, you would spend it on things that improve stormwater quality. You could use it to fund your street sweeping program. You could use it to upgrade storm sewer infrastructure that you have. It would, that's really a much more wide open topic that hasn't been developed too much, but that's pretty much what the two fees are are proposed that are on tonight's agenda. Um, any questions? Uh, just one, just for the benefit of everybody, mm. and everybody who's listening, uh, that, you know, f following us with the television. When we do the infill and we get um, development where we want it to be, does that support the outcome of more open space preservation? In my opinion, as a professional planner, absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, when when you can put public, if, when you can put development in areas where you already have available infrastructure, then you're you're avoiding de putting development into other areas where you don't have the infrastructure. If you can serve that new development more efficiently because the infrastructure is already there, it's much more cost effective. It's it's like having a house and finding a way to put the bedroom within the existing house versus adding a whole extra room that you now have to heat and paint and maintain. And it's, it's very similar to that. So it supports our objective of maintaining the rural character of the community by not creating a disincentive by penalizing people to develop where we want to develop in the first place. Right. By having these fees shared by everyone. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I'll just come right down. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. Oh. oh, that's right. That's right. When do we ask questions? You should have a public hearing, so yeah. I'm sure well, well, the introduction is we excellent. We can and bring I, more in. We'll that. get to it. But um, I did want to make that point so everybody is clear why we're why this is being proposed. Thank you very much, Maureen. I think we're good. Okay, now I will open the public hearing on the stormwater improvement fee. We have people that would like to speak. Yes, sir. I'm Larry Clough again. Uh, Still? Right. <laughs> well, basically, you know, listening to this and the real development that's going to trigger this is going to be primarily in the undeveloped areas in the western part of the Cape. You know, the areas that are going to trigger Site Location Act simply largely don't exist in the densely developed area. And matter of fact, I see I'm in the storm trout brook watershed, I'm surprised to see. But so I think what you know, I don't obviously the DEP has imposed this fee within the trout brook, and there's there's that's the way God made the world pretty much at this point. And where I think the issue really comes for me, and as somebody who deals with developers and lenders a lot, is that this fee is being imposed on areas outside of the trout brook development, and it's really you know I think looking at the numbers, it's around nineteen thousand dollars for a sort of modest sized development. It looked like it was around $2,000 a house lot, which for most developers in the current day and age is not a huge amount of money, but you know, it's still significant. And I guess what I have the, the problem with is I think it will be the larger developments that are using up the farmland because inherently to trigger DEP jurisdiction, you have to have a certain amount of impervious area, typically a minimum of 20 acres. So it is gonna be you know, the larger undeveloped tracks that are gonna be Forced that are outside of this area that will be forced to pay this fee. And you know, to the extent it facilitates uh, development in these areas, uh, you know, I, I think there's a problem. And you know, I think certainly the fee is an easy thing for most developers to write a check. I think the problem I have is we're really you know, spreading the impact of this to areas outside of the town that are, are really independent uh, of this particular problem. And I think. You know, certainly for the council to adopt this for Trout Brook is appropriate. But I think if, if you look at some of the language of the comprehensive plan we were just talking about a bit ago, you know, it said that development should pay their fair share of costs. You know, the DEP is not determined that areas outside of Trout Brook should pay this fee. And you know, why is the town making that determination at this point? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have other comments? Well, this gentleman right here.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Owens McCullough. I'm a civil engineer who's spent the better part of the last 20 years working through the progression of the stormwater laws over the years from both really development and municipal sides. Um, my experience has afforded me the opportunities to work from the design and the review side of it. Uh, tonight, uh, I'm here to express support for uh, the um, impact fee system and really on behalf of a, of a local developer, Joel Fitzpatrick of Wiley Enterprises. Joel's done quite a bit of work in uh, Cape Elizabeth over the years and uh, Joel has, does have a project that's coming up that this uh, fee would be applicable to. And you know, from a de developer's perspective, Joel's, and from my experience in design, the fee really, the fee system provides developers with some predictability and helps to uh, reduce the risk, uh, we believe. I'm actually currently working on a project in another community uh, that is located within an urban impaired stream uh, and does have the fee system in place. I think these plans provide uh, an excellent tool uh, that is not an impact fee, uh, but gives the developers some choices with respects on how they want to meet the DEP standards. Uh, it's my opinion that the compensation plan uh, really can result in better projects re with respect to restoring urban impaired streams that might otherwise occur when developers' only uh, option is to pursue, pursue a mitigation project. In other words, I think this provides uh, developers' options and the community's options uh, to better plan for how those urban impaired streams are, are dealt with. Um, so we're hopeful that uh, the council uh, would be supportive of this project and really wanted to express uh, some support from, it from a developer's perspective. And I'm certainly here if you have any questions having worked through the stormwater laws over the years and uh, have been spending some time with the new ones. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Yes. Hello, Richard Fontana, 14 dollars FONTNA again. Um, <clears throat> the fee idea is uh, one that, that really got me thinking about this whole comprehensive plan again. Um, and I'll start with a basic thing I think our civil engineer will agree with is the cost of remediation is high and highly variable depending on the situation. And I am sure that uh, fee is nice and predictable for a developer. There are a lot of advantages for developers. All those things are true. Now, why should the developers have an advantage, especially when it's a disadvantage for the town? The cost of remediation is unknown and expected to be high and highly variable, yet the DEP has set the values of these fees. There's no recourse if it's underestimated, and the remediation that the town might do might have nothing to do with the developer's area. I even saw things in a newspaper article that we would ask adjacent owners to do stuff. Um, I think that's completely inappropriate. And going on to another way of looking at it, is this is supposed to be an environmental protection law to protect a, an area that affects other people, a downstream people and upstream people, both of who can be affected by changes in the, the way the water goes and the quality of it. So an environmental re remediation project, in my opinion, should not be money replaces environment. It should be the environment is bad, we need to make it better. How do we make it better? If you're going to develop in an area where it's bad, the developer should be the one who has to make it better. Um, and for the town to take on the responsibility, as I said, is just uh, incredibly unwise, in my opinion. Um, also, I think in the environmental remediation should be concurrent. Um, if you're going to put in something here, I don't think that sh there should be a fee for the town to do something some other time, some other place. Uh, if you're going to have it, the people who live around there are immediately affected by the changes in the water flow patterns and water quality. So the changes done by the developer, I think, need to be con concurrent with the changes going on at the site. Um, another thing I saw in one of the articles is that maybe by reducing the cost in this area, we will reduce development elsewhere. I just think that model uh, doesn't fit Cape Elizabeth. It might fit a rural area where there's plenty of land and there are um, people in that area who want development competing with other towns with plenty of land. We have the opposite side of the economic equation. 
any land that comes available, developers are interested in. And then they're interested in improving the terms. So I think if there's a lot here that's available, because it's available, it's going to attract interest. If there's a lot here that's available, because it's available, it's going to attract interest. Any lot available in the most prime area, and when it becomes available and is for sale, developers are going to want, going to want that property. And I don't think it makes any difference um, whether we reduce costs somewhere else in terms of reducing development somewhere else. So overall, I think we should never try to reduce the cost of development. Our plan is uh, inadequate in, in doing that already, I think, as everyone has said. So in terms of this fee exchange, I think we should have fees, but not in lieu of. The fees should be for the town to pay an inspector to come in and see if the contractor indeed, independently, because I think as we've just seen, the hired guns will be for the inspector. We need to have the town hire somebody with this fee that the town believes will give an honest assessment of whether that job has been done correctly. Um, and last, I think apparently the town has identified uh, wetland or uh, key watershed for development and uh, perhaps that was a mistake and it should be changed. Also, uh, the cost of infrastructure improvements may be less near South Portland because you don't, because that's where the sewer lines go. However, the cost should be borne by the developers, so the town should not really care uh, so much about the location of these sewer lines. I think the town should probably have a policy going forward of uh, pu putting in sewer area uh, sewage for any large development because we're already hitting the limit on what um, septic systems can handle in terms of density. Um, so I just uh, reiterate, uh, I think that it's a very bad idea for the town from a taxpayer point of view to uh, take on the kind of responsibility and it doesn't meet the whole objectives of the DEP or the, the environment which is this really is an important issue in this area and we should be addressing that issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you Richard. Okay, anybody else? Is there anybody else that would like to make a comment regarding this issue? I would briefly. Yes, Mike. Yeah, I would briefly, as not speaking for the town council, but just cite one example as a someone responsible for some some property in town. Uh, I've known there was a group of parents who wanted to put dugouts in at the high school, uh, at Capano Field and at uh, at Holman Field, uh, four dugouts all together. Uh, we went, were going through a permit permitting process because the land was under site plan review because of the previous work done on the school grounds. Uh, the DEP said that we would have to get a special stormwater permit and do special uh, stormwater actions as a result of the, the additional impervious surface of these dugouts. Uh, we, we ended up, because we had already had a system in place where we had had an overall stormwater plan for, for the whole town center, and we had done some quite extensive stormwater, uh, stormwater mitigation on, on the uh, school grounds, we pointed out that we, we had actually been removed some impervious service and eventually the DEP relented. But you know, unless you have a system in place like this, and you know, it, the council can debate whether or not this is appropriate or not and all the different issues, but unless you have a system in place like this, every property owner could very well begin to deal with some of the issues that the town is now dealing with in terms of any time they want to make any slight improvement on their property. Uh, the whole NIPTES process, as they call it, and the, the whole you know, retinue of stormwater regulations now are, are, are quite extensive, and I think there are many surprises ahead even for individual homeowners, and a, a system like this uh, could help to alleviate in the long run a lot of those concerns. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Okay, I now uh, close the public hearing on stormwater improvement fee. We will move on. Okay, can we on get to, Maureen back up here for questions? Oh, absolutely. Once we, why don't we open Thank this you. up? Are we voting on this time? Uh, item number 135, and um, you want to do that before we uh, 
Move into this item. I'm sorry, I, 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 didn't hear the, I didn't hear the end of what you said. I, item 135, adoption of stormwater improvement. Why don't we have a motion on it? Get us in second, then we'll. I'll... Anybody? Well, I'll just so we can discuss it, I'll propose that we adopt the stormwater improvement fee plan as proposed in the memo from the town planner dated July 31, 2007. Okay. We have a second. Second motion. All right, Jim. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, now discussion. Could I could I ask? Yes. Uh, is now the time when I can ask some questions? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead, Maureen. You can help us out. Thanks, Maureen. Sure. <laughs> Don't really. Maureen, I had several questions. Yeah. One is I kept seeing references in this memo um, to BMP, and for the life of me, I could not figure out what BMP meant. Could you? Best management practices. Oh, okay. And they're a series. If I have to give you a really technical answer, I'm going to ask the enemy Owens to come up here and he can explain it to you. But they're generally, they're an evolving series of techniques. A lot of them are heavily designed. Some of them are pretty naturalized for accomplishing a task. For example, one of the most common BMPs, and in, in this, this is like, you know, singing right to Cape Elizabeth, is creating a vegetated buffer strip so that water, storm water, can run across the vegetated, the vegetation, and the and because it's a natural vegetated strip, as long as you don't have too much water flow going across it, it can actually clean the storm water and it tends to absorb some of the storm water. So that's, you know, that's a classic BMP that Cape Elizabeth already uses very heavily and is, a, in fact, a relatively inexpensive BMP. Okay, and if I have one other Please. question. I, I, I just want to make sure I understand this. Um, within the Trout Brook watershed, the, mm -hmm. up at the top there, outlined in black, I just confirm for me whether this is correct or not, please. The DEP, the state, is requiring that um, they've laid down rules that we have to uh, mitigate problems with the, that area due to the watershed being impaired. And you can do it in two ways. You can have developers solve each and every problem that comes along, or you can have develop, developers pay a fee, and then the town gets to decide which of which priority projects to do. Yes. Okay. And then in conjunction with this other fee, the, the reason that the stormwater improvement fee that you've proposed that is so that there, there's going to be extra cost to developers within the Trout Brook area. Right. Which would mean that it would be an incentive, it would be more expensive to develop property there, which would mean that it would be cheaper to, to develop property in the southern part of town, not in the watershed, thus driving developers who are interested in maximizing their profit to areas of town that are currently um, zoned as non-growth, not as the growth areas of town. Correct. So the whole concept here of having these two fees work in conjunction is to have fees on the Trout Brook area, fees on the non-Trout Brook area to sort of equalize it so that we're not driving um, development down to the other parts of town where we traditionally have not wanted development. We're trying to reestablish the equilibrium that the town has already established with its land use codes. So it becomes more expensive for developers sort of equally all across town. They have yes. to pay a fee anywhere they're going right. to have to pay an additional fee anywhere. It's just more where will the fee money go. Right. Trout Brook money will go for Trout Brook projects, and the, the non-Trout Brook money would go for stormwater mitigation through the whole town. It, it neutralizes the policy impact of this okay. and increases the fees and increases the funding that you'll have available for stormwater mitigation townwide. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood. Excellent um, clarification. I'm reading Thank this. Thank you. Thank you. Cynthia. I'm sorry, Jim. I'll get to you. You want to go first? Answer. Okay. okay. Um, I feel like maybe I shouldn't be asking questions about the state program, but I, I do have some questions about the state program. Um, just looking at the um, Trout Brook Watershed Community Fee Utilization Plan, as it's described in the memo, I understand there's this 
choice we have to either um, impose on the developer an obligation to have a mitigation project or pay a fee. And my question is, is if we went with the former and just said, we're not going to do the fee program, we're going to just have the mitigation, would the value of the mitigation project be comparable to the fee? First of all, you wouldn't have to do anything because the developer is required to do it under the DEP rules, so they would, pro and because the DEP hasn't, you can only do the fee, if I understand it correctly, if you do this plan. Right. The DEP hasn't adopted a plan for any watershed in the state. So every time you find an urban impaired watershed and the town hasn't taken any action, you have to look for a mitigation project. Okay, and my the thing is, the DEP doesn't care where it's located. And, you know, with great respect to our community to the north, there's a lot more opportunity for mitigation in South Portland than there is in Cape Elizabeth. So that's, that's one thing that the Cape Town Council may care about. The other thing I would, I would ask you to think about is that when you're, you've got a developer looking for a mitigation project, they're looking for the project that is as large as it needs to be to meet their needs and absolutely no larger. So they're not exactly looking for the best project for the watershed. They're looking for something that, that gets them over the hump. They're looking for the easiest route to go if you have to acquire um, permission from private property owners, they're going to try to get out of that route. I mean, you have to ask yourself how you want improvements to be made to the watershed. And, you know, developers are motivated by, you know, minimizing risk, minimizing costs, minimizing the time they have to spend on it. Um, but I guess my question is, under the DEP regs, I don't mm. expect you to be an expert in this, but That's do you good. happen to know <laughs> that in the towns where there isn't this fee plan, whether mm -hmm. the developer is, uh, the obligation on the developer is to do a mitigation project of a certain monetary value or, or a project I believe that's supposed there's, to match? Yeah, and I don't, I don't know if there's an exact dollar amount, but it has to be proportional to the amount of impact they're having. Okay, so the fee that we're going to be asked developers to pay is mm -hmm. comparable to the, the cost that a mitigation well, project might be. You know, I, I haven't set up the rules and I didn't set up the fee. I, have to, I, I can make the assumption that when the DEP set up the fee system, they made it comparable. Ooh. I know, and I'm not going to make that assumption. Yeah. That's right. Okay. I, I, I have talked to uh, not just this particular engineer, but the town's engineer. And as, as Mr. McGovern stated, you know, we've been in the position of being the developer. And, you know, you're not really saying what's the best project. You're saying what's nearest that we can, we can define that we're not going to dive into a project and open up a hornet's nest of other problems. So what is it that we can work on that we can nibble on the edges and get us over the hump? Okay. Um, I just have a couple. May I just? Okay. Um, I, I'm hearing the argument about, um, I, I, from where I'm coming from, I think the Troutbrook Watershed Community Fee Utilization Plan is probably a good idea. I'm wondering, though, about whether the fee matches the mitigation project, but I'll find you know, I can think about that. But with respect to the second thing, the creation of the stormwater improvement fee, the argument seems to be, and I, and I get it, um, you know, you're going to try to encourage development in the areas that we've designated as growth areas, but when I look at the map, and I, I didn't measure it, but just an eyeball, um, look at the map, it seems to me there's plenty of yellow outside the watershed and there's plenty of orange and so that... But there's also uh, plenty of pale yellow. Right, but isn't that zoned? I mean, haven't we zoned that in a way that would be somewhat of a disincentive to development? I guess I'm not convinced yeah. that we need to have but, a fee and to encourage development. I'd go back to the comprehensive plan analysis and the state planning office does require us to look at growth that's happened in the past, to compare where the growth is located to where we said we wanted growth to locate. And, you know, according to that analysis, we said we wanted, um, we wanted to accommodate as much growth as possible in our infill areas, which is this, pretty much this orange area, a little bit in the purple. We said we wanted to accommodate growth 
um, in immediately adjacent to existing neighborhoods, so in or adjacent to existing neighborhoods. And then we said we wanted the rest of our growth to go into our growth areas. And you know whether you like it or not, the, the bright yellow are the areas that, that the town identified as growth areas. Well, I know, but I'm going to stop you there for a second. Yeah, but if you look at, and I, I'm almost to my number Okay. Uh, if you look at what we did in the town from 1998 to 2006 in terms of building permits issued, 92% of the growth in the town occurred in the places you said you wanted to absorb new growth. Right. right? But that number, you can't find it anywhere else. And when you start having things like this, it erodes, it erodes your policies. It seems to me, though, when you say like the we did and we said, I mean, you're talking to a second term town councilor. And so I guess I'm not going to own that as it. The, the that's growth areas in the right place? No, well, yeah, I mean, we're, yeah, we're, and that's we're considering the comprehensive plan, and so it seems to me now is a good time to consider um, whether or not what we did um, is what we want to do going forward. And it's, I just don't like the idea of encouraging, having imposing on developers outside this watershed district mm -hmm. fees. It just sounds to me like government red tape. And I don't like the idea of somehow leveling the playing field between development in the watershed and development outside the watershed. It seems to me we should be discouraging development around a watershed that has been identified as being vulnerable. Right. So let's. <laughs> I think that um, at this point, I want to clarify one thing. And sometimes we use terminology and we have a certain meaning in our own mind, what that means. Um, or definition, and when people use the term watershed, it sounds like a green zone. It sounds like a green zone to me. I was like, why would you build a house in a watershed? Can you explain what the watershed is? Yeah, the watershed yeah, the, is, and the fact that uh, yeah. developing in a watershed does that mean? And you know, I know the answer to my question, but I okay. want to clarify this. All development. We're going to build. Yeah you know, close to an area that we shouldn't be building, like uh, right next to the water or no. in an area where we're going to cause environmental damage? Yeah. That's, I, think, I think that's the perception, and I want you to please clarify that. All development, any development anywhere is in a watershed, okay. because a watershed is where you have the topographical drainage divides and where you have a point, high point where when it rains, water either goes in this direction or this direction. So if we're not developing in the Trout Brook watershed, then we're developing in the Willow Brook watershed, or we're developing in the Saco Bay estuary watershed. So anywhere you develop is in a watershed. You're not developing in the brook. And, and Cape Elizabeth, I still say, has the toughest regulations in the state, bar none, in terms of protecting sensitive natural areas. And that's areas that are water, wetlands. We have 250 foot buffers that no one else imposes on wetlands the size that we impose them on. We have uh, 75 foot buffers on Trout Brook. And, and just to make sure this is clear, Trout Brook runs along here. On the Cape Elizabeth side of Trout Brook, we have a 75 foot setback buffer that's required by state shoreland zoning. On the South Portland side of Trout Brook, it's a 40 foot setback because they were able to apply for a reduction through the state zoning because they didn't want to make any of their existing homes have non-conforming issues. Cape Elizabeth said it's supposed to be 75 feet. We're going to impose a 75 foot setback. So, you know, it's a good point. We're not saying that we're allowing people to build in a brook. We're saying that, you know, in fact, you know, this area right here is a couple of hundred feet from the headwaters of Trout Brook. It's way far away. And between the brook and the proposed development, there would be requirements by the state for buffers. There would be requirements by the town for buffers. And all the other stormwater rules that the town has to make sure that downstream properties aren't flooded were, would still be in place. We, we still require inspections by our own engineer that the developer pays for. This is a whole new level of restriction. Does that Excellent. answer your question? Thank you for that clarification. I, it's very important people need to un, that people understand that we're not weakening our environmental standards and our protection of, of, of watersheds, if you will, or any other area. 
I'm going to go to Jim and I'll come up. Yeah, uh, during our comp plan hearing, uh, we had one speaker that uh, asked about the decision making process and that. Uh, who decided that the RB and RC districts would, uh, zones would be uh, where we wanted to channel development. Could you just touch briefly on the history sure. of that decision making process? That came out of the 1993 comprehensive plan, which actually, the recommendations were formally adopted a second time in 1993. There were actually a committee that came up with it in 1990. And what they did is, and again, you're required by the state to identify areas where you want growth to occur, areas where you don't want growth to occur. And when you submit your plan, they make sure that your growth area isn't too big or too small, which is why you have to come up with predictions. But what the community did that was here in 1990, which was before I was hired, but my understanding is they looked at the whole town and they looked at the areas of town where they thought there were the least amount of natural resource sensitivity restrictions and the, the greatest opportunity to absorb development without having significant impacts on the character of the community. Clearly, every time someone cuts down a tree and builds a house, it changes the town. But there are places where you can put development that have dramatic, unalterable, forever vistic type of views impact. And then there are ways where you can accommodate growth and try to, try to make it blend in with the town. So these, this was basically the major growth area that came out of that process. It had the least amount of wetlands. Um, it did not have access to sewer at that time. It does now. This area also fairly high, not very wet. And then these pieces came out, they're, they're basically large pieces, again, relatively free of natural resource restrictions. And, and the just to follow through, the comprehensive plan recommended these, these areas as potential growth areas, but you then need to change the zoning. So in 1997, the town adopted a, a new zoning ordinance, user-friendly, better format, but the other thing they did as part of that is implement a lot of those 1993 comprehensive plan recommendations. One of the major ones was to create a new zoning district. You had an RC and an RA, and they created a new district called the RB, and they put the growth areas into the RB district with a restriction that if you wanted to develop a subdivision in these areas, you had to cluster the subdivision and you had to set aside 40% of the open, 40% of the total land area as open space. Prior to the creation of that RB district, you did not have to set aside 40% of the land area as open space. I'm going to ask you yeah. to yeah. over here, like mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to comment that it felt like the, to, to make this decision on vote on, on it tonight feels premature to me because We've sort of just gone through this whole process. Many, many people emailed us. A lot of great people showed up and had interesting and insightful things to say. I feel like it's our job now to go back and review the comprehensive plan in a, in a, in a total way. And so this is specific, but, but we need to question the generalities on which it's built. Is that, you know, Cynthia brought this up, is that actually the growth area where we want to continue? Do we want to say in our next comprehensive plan that that's our growth area? and so forth and whatnot. It's the, li the likelihood is that we will, but why vote on this before we've established the foundation beneath it? And secondly, the email we received today from the Department of Environmental Protection caused me some concern. The, the director of the Division of Watershed Management writes a two and a half page letter and he concludes by saying, in summary, while we think you have some good ideas, we think they need further work at this time. I'm confident that we can approve a CFUP using just a few ideas with a bit more work on them, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so I feel like we're voting on something that isn't complete. And, and then one of his colleagues writes, overall, my initial reaction is for the Cape Elizabeth folks to review and incorporate the comments by MDEP staff and approve, reject it as a conceptual plan only, underlined. Then more refinements based upon any additional field visits, available data, and meetings could be incorporated into a revised CFUP. That says to me that we're not ready to vote on it, that we should have more conversation. That's how I feel. Um, I, I agree with Sarah wholeheartedly. I um, was very concerned about voting for, on something that the DEP said we might really want to vote on in concept. Um, that's my first concern. My second concern, so I think it's premature. I absolutely think we should table this 
um, and maybe table it for a couple of months. I think you had a great idea about putting it off until after the comp plan. Um, it also smells very much to me like an impact fee. And we talk a lot about the cost of housing and not being able to have housing for our police officers, our teachers, our nurses, other people in town. And you know, $2,000 here, $2,000 there, and soon you have a house that people of the median income, or in, in our case, I mean, we looked at this a lot in the comp plan and found that people who make 130% of the median income, you know, working people with great jobs can't afford to build houses in Cape Elizabeth. And I have great difficulty um, having impact fees that are sort of a sledgehammer approach to, um, in this case, remediating stormwater. So um, I, I'm not sure ultimately where I will come out on it, but um, I am concerned about increasing the cost of housing. I am concerned that most of the growth area, um, I, which was identified in 93 and I think has served the town well, is outside of the watershed. So I don't see us um, really distorting where we want to direct growth. And in fact, maybe we don't want to direct it in the watershed. Um, so uh, that, plus the fact that I also don't think we have enough information. Um, I, I'm not really prepared to vote on either of these tonight. David. Oh, Before you table it. Yes. Well, there's a motion on it. Oh, was there a motion? There's a motion on it. Yes. Oh, there is. Sorry. I didn't hear the motion. I didn't make a motion to table. There's I had a motion. Made a motion for the purpose of discussion mm -hmm. so I could right. warrant yeah. my question. David, did you have a. But I would just caution everyone that if, if anybody does make a motion to table, then we can't discuss that's it. That's right. No, that's why I wanted to ask. That's why question. I didn't make a motion. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, did, did you have a comment, David? Thank you. I do have a few questions for Maureen, if I may. Yeah, that's fine, I didn't know you. Um, in no particular order, but what exactly is the impairment of the Trout Brook watershed? Chapter four of the Urban Streams Report, which I think we have posted on the website, does the most concise and comprehensive analysis of that that I have found. And it talks about impairment at various types. It talks about, um, they do tests where they take a bunch of rocks and they put them in a net bag and they drop them in the water and they leave them there for a while and then they take them out of the water and they count the organisms on them and we don't have enough. So it's, it's not a very good habitat. Um, we have oxygen level issues. We are finding high levels of things that we shouldn't have in there, pollutants. Uh, one of the concerns I had, and I still have even with the DEP comments, is that I do believe that the quality of the information, especially in Cape Elizabeth, is not very good. Um, but if you, if you go into that report, and I'm not a scientist, it will talk about fluvial geomorphology and all the kinds of things that are not very good. The other thing that's really interesting about all the reports I read was that it seemed that the general conclusion was that Trailbrook really wasn't that bad. It was missing standards by not that much. And in fact, it seems to be having a little bit of improvement here and there. The, the sinuosity uh, project that was described last month um, actually suggests that you know, it's starting to do better. And, and the recommendations for projects, which I, we absolutely need to meet with DEP and work on these, I mean, I think things like just reestablishing a vegetated buffer along the banks of the brook might have a significant impact. Um, until, I think, 2005, uh, the city of South Portland had a combined sewer overflow discharge still going into Trout Brook, and that's been taken out now. So it's, it's, a, it's, doing, it's, doing not, it's not meeting its water quality classification, but it doesn't seem like there would be that much work that would need to be done. And the determination of impairment was made by the DEP. When? When I think that the urban impaired watersheds were designated when they changed the stormwater rules last November, but I couldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet the farm on that. So we learned of this when? We heard about this when Spurwink Woods 
was being proposed. But they came in just before the deadline. So we knew it was out there, and that's why it's, it's being brought to you fairly concurrently with at least one project that we know it's, it's going to have an impact on. And is there any suggestion that further studies might show that, in fact, it's not impaired and that we don't need to work within this? Well, this is one of, the, one of the recommendations I had made for a project was to spend some of the money to do a little bit more testing. And I think I'm going to need to spend a lot more quality time with DEP encouraging them to consider that as a viable opportunity to spend the money. Because I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, a morph, geomorphologist and, and I don't count the, the bugs on the rocks. But uh, if you look at the information that, that the DEP has available, and you know, again, I could have missed some of it, there just doesn't seem to be a lot in Cape Elizabeth. A lot of the information was, was right here. And a lot of it has testing data all the way through in South Portland, through all of those developed neighborhoods, and outletting into, into Mill Creek, which is you know, a, a very heavily developed urban area. And you know, I'd like to get more data, but they're, they're saying, just assume there's a problem and spend the money to fix it. And I'd, you know, I'd kind of like to not do that. Um, well, but I'd obviously like to not the, do that yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, but we're not going to be able to convince them of anything unless we actually do a lot more work. And in the meantime, we've, I mean, we have projects that could go in this direction or this direction. And there are projects that, and this I'm trying to speak in a general term, um, can come in under the site location of development law rules. And if they come in under those rules, none of this applies. Um, but if you look at the project that is proposed triggers this review and you look at the project that could be proposed that doesn't trigger this review, you have to say, is that really a better project for the town? And that's why I, I'm concerned that we need to deal with this situation. Well, what if we don't deal with it? You, you don't we... have to. You, what will happen is any project that, that triggers the site location law in Trout Brook will have to comply with the urban impaired watershed standards. The likelihood is, I mean, if they can't find a degraded area on the site, and uh, we've had this problem in the past. Cape Elizabeth has done a really good job of protecting natural areas. Consequently, when we need to get credits because we're actually having an impact, because we're developing an area that's not developed now, we can't find a degraded area. So there's, I think there's a good chance that whoever's doing a project in this area is going to go to South Portland to look for a mitigation project. Okay. Then I heard two statements that maybe I misunderstood, but they mm -hmm. seem to be conflicting. One was that the folks who are likely to have to deal with the impairment, who would fall within whatever the standards mm -hmm. are, are developers who are developing multiple acres. Yeah, I, I, I think mean, I heard that correctly. Usually, and again, I, I hate interpreting DEP law because you can't get a consistent interpretation from it. But generally, if you're creating more than 20,000 square feet or impervious area or developing 20 acres or more, you're going to trigger the site law. And there, like everything else, there's exceptions and there's way, ways to recalculate it. But it's the bigger projects that are going to trigger it. And then, I, it, and again, I may not have heard this correctly, I heard our town manager use an example that somewhat like the town in building the dugouts mm. sort of stumbled into this impervious watershed issue. And the way the town the, did it. The suggestion was that mm -hmm. individual homeowners within the watershed would similarly be finding themselves facing those issues. But it sounds like they wouldn't be because an individual homeowner is not going to trigger the 20,000 square feet of impervious service. That's a half an acre. Right. And in fact, the but town once you have the has site a site law. permit. That's right. why. But it is not going to right. affect it, 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 every little. But it, it was in the aggregate that's of all right. the other things. That were it's because we have a site permit. And when you, go, when you change anything in your site permit, you have to go back. I, I understand. But I guess so. many of these subdivisions also will be under these site permits. Yeah. That's true. What, what, and that's what you. Go to the that's a what subdivision you can't in the sense of a subdivision developer, not an. But then the developer moves on, and then Joe resident, Gene resident comes in, and they're immediately faced with these issues. Is that correct? It doesn't work that, quite that way. 
it I'd falls on to, the individual homeowner I would, who wants to. I would pose that question to a DEP staff person in writing to their and ask line? for a response in writing before I would dare answer that. I don't think it works. Yet. Um, well, a, a couple other questions. Just, I'm just trying sure. to. Sure. No, no, no. It's, it's a complicated topic. All this. Um, the one one comment that Mr. Fun Tana made um, that seemed to resonate with me was this idea that people will develop wherever a lot is available. I mean, we have with us in our presence, I think the, the master creative developer, and I mean that in, in, <laughs> in the kindest and most complimentary way with Mr. Fitzpatrick. He has been very creative in finding places, little single lots to develop that other people would have never dreamt were developable. And he's done that by being creative. And he's been able to make what I assume is a good living by being creative. Um, and if he's able to find, and I don't mean he necessarily, but a developer, a creative developer, is able to find a lot to develop in any part of town, um, and there's a sense that there is a market to sell a house that's built on that lot, wherever it may be, I don't see why creating the opportunity to develop in the RC or the RB district would keep that developer or in any way deter that developer from doing their creative development outside the RC or RB area? Yeah. Two, two responses. One, 92% of the development from 1998 to 2006 happened where the town said it wanted it to happen. And it didn't just say, we want it to happen here. But we crafted at least half a dozen policies and ordinances that all push development in certain directions. And developers, you know, who are, mo who are making a living like most of us are, need to minimize their risk in order to make a living. And so if you say, this is where we think we want development to happen, this is where, you know, I'll tell you, I have developers who come in and, and the smart ones will ask, what's the problem, what, what about this property? And I'll say, these are the issues that I know of. Da, 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 da. And there are many properties that get passed over, over and over. I, I'm looking at this map right now and I can tell you of two large tracts of land that haven't moved at all and they're not in growth areas. You know, a developer will, will look at this and there's a level of comfort that it's not going to be as difficult. Uh, we just had a large project right in this area. And, you know, was it popular with the abutters? No, it wasn't. But it, it did everything that the ordinances said it wanted, and it was, it was well received by the planning board. So, you know, two, my two points would be, you know, the evidence shows that our policies are directing growth where we're saying we want it to occur. Now, maybe we're not happy with those locations now that it's there. Um, and maybe we want to decide we want to push it in a different location. But you can use local policies to really effectuate that growth. And if you, if you have something like this come in, you can ignore it. But what it does is it undermines your local land use decisions. And if you, you know, if you want the state to have more say, in, in what, how growth happens in your town, then you, can, you, you don't have to do anything more. But it just seems like this town has worked really hard with a lot of ordinances and a lot of policies and some public investment to push de development in certain directions. But you may want to you know, ask Mr. Fitzpatrick what motivates him to develop one property after another. Well, not, <laughs> not within the context of this meeting, I want. No. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, I do have one more question. Um, I think earlier in the hearing on the comprehensive plan, there was a number of 330, and that was the estimated number of yep. development or house lots. Yes. Projected that yes. we need over the next no, 15. Not need. Or, or what want? we're what we're we have to make. Like I said, the state planning office requires us to predict how much growth we're going to have, and then they require us to identify where we want that growth to occur and we have to come up with policies that show how we're going to direct the growth in those locations. So you've got to start with prediction. 
And yes, there are some numbers in there that GPCOG directed because we paid them to do that information for us. But the way that GPCOG generates those numbers from the state is a top-down approach. Okay, Basically, but the number, the conclusion. The number of 330, 330. 330 came from the number. No, no, is, it, is that the number? It, I'm just it's up to, reminding you. It's up to you what the number yeah. Okay, but was that what you said the number was? Yeah, the, and, okay. but I want to tell you how the three we're But no, let talking. me finish my question, okay. and then you can sure. ask your thing. So uh, my question is, if assuming that the number 330 is, is the number. The magic number. The, num the magic number. My question is, um, in the area outside the watershed, that mm -hmm. yellow and orange, is there enough land in those areas to have 330 lots? Probably. Okay. Thank you. The, the, the comp plan actually has a recommendation to increase density in those areas. And if you increase the density, absolutely, you'll, you'll have enough without it. If you don't increase the density, my guess is you'll probably still have Okay. That. Thank you. I'm sorry, may I ask one more question? Yes. We, we, we do need to move on, though, everybody. Just yeah. What <laughs> is your best guess of the number that the state, the lowest number, of houses that we could say we intend to put in in the next 20 years that the state would still pass our comprehensive plan? I, I think the number in the comprehensive plan is, is the number I would submit to the state and any number less than that, we just have to throw it at them, make a reasonable um, argument for why it's a good number and see what they say. Because you hear stories of towns in Maine that say we're going to issue nine building permits per year for the rest of time, and they seem to get away with it. Well, if they've only been issuing nine permits a year, that makes a lot of sense. It, it depends on what your rationale is. The 330 is an average from 1990 to 2006 with a projection that growth will slowly decline. Now, we could make an argument that growth is going to decline a little bit more aggressively than we have, and the 330 number can go down to a lower number, and we'll send it to the state and see what they say. But I think if, if, if we just come up with a, a wild number with no rational basis, um, then we're going to be challenged. What, could, you, could a rational basis be that the town has um, arrived at a consensus that we wish to do less building than we have in the past and give the reasons why and so forth and present a cogent argument and say, therefore, we, we, only gonna, we only want to build at half the rate we have been for the last 15 years. Would that be acceptable to them? You could present that as a goal but then you would have to also include implementation steps that would demonstrate how you're going to implement that goal. Because just saying you don't want the growth isn't going to sell. Um, you know, you, you could come up with a $20 million bond for Cape Elizabeth's future and you're going to buy a lot of open space and that's an implementation step. And you'd have to show that fiscally you could sustain that because we're required to submit a capital improvement program with the comprehensive plan. But you can't just, you, you could say we just don't want growth and, and they'll kick it back, I think. Thanks. Yeah. I want to make a comment before the table motion. Right. I just wanted to return to the stormwater issue for, for one minute. And I, th I think sometimes in the abstract we forget to look back at the big picture. And, you know, what are we, what are we doing as far as stormwater management? What have we done? Uh, during the last year, the town invested over a million dollars in stormwater management, drainage issues in Elizabeth Park, on Running Tide Road in uh, Broad Cove, on uh, streets in, in the uh, Cape Cottage area of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, we just did, in the recent years, we've done a major drainage project on Hunts Point Road. Uh, we've done one on Salt Spray Lane. We've done one on Broad Cove Road. Uh, there's one about to be done in the, the next uh, few weeks uh, on Old Ocean House Road. Uh, there's a project that was just done a couple weeks ago on Shore Road, right near Old Colony Lane. Uh, all of these things cost money. Uh, Sometimes developers share the expense. Sometimes it's all the town's expense. As part of the, the bond issue that's been approved for work this spring, uh, potentially next spring, there's about another six to $700,000 of stormwater work, storm water work to be done in the town center. Uh, it is a major expense for the town. Uh, and every time I pick up the newspaper, there's some new petition drive looking at reducing, for example, the latest one is let's reduce the excise tax in half. 
uh, let's put Tabor in with, with slightly different rules. Uh, let's bring back Pulaski. Let's spend money on a, on a bond issue to buy land. Let's spend money on a new library. Let's spend 8% more for the county. Let's, you know, it, you know it, it's, a, it's an endless dreams of, of every group. Uh, that there's, there's no matching of, of expectations for the spending of tax dollars with the supply of tax dollars. Uh, there's a total inconsistency. What, what Maureen has proposed is something that looks at the environment, that's tied in with the land use ordinances, and that actually provides resources other than from tax dollars to address a major mandate of the federal government that's being aggressively uh, implemented by state government. Uh, you know, I applaud her for the effort. I understand the council wishes to look at this more, but you, I think it's important that you, you look at this in its entirety. Stormwater is, is going to be a major initiative over the next 10 years, and it's going to be done in an environment with very little funding source for it. And I, I think a fee such as what Maureen has proposed uh, is exactly in keeping what I'm hearing citizens say otherwise, except in the precise moment of tonight. Uh, you know, they, want, they don't want big tax increases. They want the users to pay. They want the developers to pay. They want the environment taken care of. And for the most part, I think this plan does that. So I would hope that the council would not table this for too long and that you might table this to uh, when you'll have a chance to look at it in conjunction with the adoption of the, the comprehensive plan. Stormwater challenges are not going to go away and uh, it's going to be costing probably millions of dollars uh, over the next 20 years. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. Um, right now we have a motion on the floor. It's been seconded. We've had discussion. Did you want to? I'd like to address my motion. Okay. Um, and I did have one final question because what okay, I'm going to Dan. address, what's the time urgency of this? In I think words, can um, put this off for I think it, off I time? honestly think that the that you need a month to to give at least a month to give me some time to work out the wrinkles with the DEP. Okay. Um, I think you have a project that is going to be in in the pipeline that will need an answer in four to six months. So I, I think it's a, I think it's a short. You have some time. Okay, that, that's very helpful. Thank you. I have learned a lot tonight, uh, and I have been persuaded by Councillor Lynch's comments and some of the other comments that we need to do, or I need to do a little more rumination of this. I made this motion for the purpose of discussion, and I think we've had a great discussion, but I'd like to withdraw my motion. So I'm withdrawing it. And if somebody else wants to make a motion to table, they can do fine. so. But I would like to withdraw my motion. Okay. Can I make a motion to, um, I'm going to move to table this t uh, to the November meeting, just in light of all the other things that on our agenda, most specifically the comprehensive plan. Uh, Monday, November 5th is the first one. The first Monday regular meeting is my motion. Second. Okay, any, okay, that's a table, so all in favor? There we go. Great discussion. Thanks, Maureen, for all your expert assistance. I think there's two items. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Oh, yes. Can I make one observation? Yes. Our town planner, Maureen, stands up here, I won't <laughs> call it under fire, but... I would. I would. <laughs> but if anybody in this room thinks that what she does or what she did tonight is or was easy. I, I don't think there's anything easy about it. She fields questions from all seven of us, from different directions, from different points of view. She fields them with grace, um, very knowledgeably, um, very patiently. And I just want to acknowledge that and thank her for the work she's done. Second. <laughs> Third. <laughs> I think we all agree it, with it's that. It's unanimous. Great job. Um, okay, now we have another public hearing. And <laughs> believe it or not. And you don't have to speak if you don't want to. <laughs> um, I open the public hearing. 
I hereby open the public hearing on Trout Brook Watershed Community Fee Utilization Plan. So we've had a very good introduction, and Maureen addressed it in her other comments, so I'm not going to ask you to get up here and do it again unless you have something to add. Um, but if anyone would like to make a comment, feel free. Joel. Joel Fitzpatrick uh, with Wiley Enterprises and Fitzpatrick Associates. We're going to be uh, developing some property on Eastman Road that's in this watershed in sort of the yellow area here. And I've heard a couple comments that I just want to comment on. I'm not really great at speaking, so I, I'll make it quick. But there is a lot of land here in this area that is developable. Um, Maxwell alone is probably 150 acres. Uh, Trout Brook goes right through the middle of his field. Um, he pumps water out of, the, out of one of the ponds there. So there's, there's some land here that can, can potentially be developed. Um, we do have a lot of different options on this property, um, and I'm just going to talk about timing. Uh, we've got the choice of mitigating or giving a fee um, to this watershed. Uh, and. It, you know, we're going to develop the property either way. Um, we can do the fee, we can mitigate in South Portland or somewhere, uh, maybe even my property if it needs to be. Um, so as far as the timing goes, I'd rather see it go into a fee where it's good for the town. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not just for me, it's, it's, for, it's for the town. So, uh, you know, mitigating uh, in South Portland just doesn't seem the right way to go, but if that's what I have to do, that's what we're going to do. Um, uh, and we do have uh, probably s well, five, six, seven months of, of uh, planning, to, uh, planning board procedures to go through. But we've got to make we've got to make some decisions on this watershed uh, fee or uh, mitigation sooner than six months. And I just wanted to let you know that we are on some type of time schedule. Can I answer any questions when I'm up here? <laughs> yeah. uh, Joel, could you give us an idea of what kind of time constraint you would be under for that type of decision? Well, I guess I'd have to ask Owens. Uh, it's, still, it's still up in the air, uh, but uh, we need to have, before, before the final approval, which we're hoping for, uh, you know, knock on wood, to get final approval in six or seven months. process we're going to be going through is through a site location permit with the DEP, but um, as part of that process, even before we get to the end, we need to try to make, give them some direction on how we're going to uh, address the urban impaired stream criteria. So uh, while uh, it is true that the approvals process typically takes five to seven months to get through, um, we'll be at a critical path decision within a, within a month or two having to decide which way we go um, uh, because we'll have to work through those details to meet that time frame in the end. So there is some timing that we need to, to move a little quicker um, um, as we can uh, on that. And again, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Sorry, can, can, you be, can you clarify that path? It's an it's a, it's a engineering method, critical path method. You have to do uh, one thing before you Oh, I'm start. sorry. So <laughs> the project itself isn't under question. You've decided what you're going to do there. It's a question of how you're going to do it. That's or correct. Or is there some question depending on fees of what you would actually do with the land? Yeah. The, the, the question is, is, it's not that if, if this fee wasn't passed, he, uh, Joel couldn't do a project on that land. It's, it's how we address the urban impaired. We've got some options. We could go off-site, go into South Portland, find a parking lot or a pavement area and put in a BMP, one of the best management practices, and, and um, address the water quality there. Because it's in the watershed, well, you could actually go into South Portland and address it in there uh, because of the development in that area. Um, a fee system would go to the town. Um, the town could use that fee system to look at other areas that they might be able to do some mitigation and get a bigger benefit um, in a different area. So the town has some control then over how that work is done. Sorry. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. Any other comments? Or Joel, did you have something? One last. I, I mentioned the Maxwell's. There's no, there's no intent to, to develop Maxwell's land at all. That was just an example of some <laughs> property in the circle here. But the land is for sale <laughs> between the Mormon Church and, and uh, Spermic Avenue. That's correct. Which, that which is, is also good. affected by all of this, potentially. All right. Thank you. Okay. Peter. Peter Carter, C-O-T-T-E-R, 21 Ocean House Road, Cape Elizabeth. For the past 23 years, I have lived along the shores of Trout Brook, if you will, one of the only places where it's actually a navigable stream. I have seen it in the middle of nor'easters. I've seen it in the middle of hurricanes. I've seen it in droughts of summer. The stream will go anywhere from two inches to eight feet deep, anywhere from four feet wide to 50 feet wide. If there is a nor'easter ever scheduled for Cape Elizabeth that the local weather forecasters are saying will arrive as a storm surge right at high tide and there will be coastal flooding, I invite anybody in the room to come to my house. You won't have to stand in the rain. I'll invite you into my living room. You can witness this fact just by what, looking out the back windows. That stream is affected by high tide, and it travels from Higgins Beach to Mill Cove in South Portland. I've walked it during storm surges, and I know this for a fact. Maureen is right, and too recently the city of South Portland did have a storm water and sewage drain into that stream. They should have sold bumper stickers saying, flush your toilet south, Cape Elizabeth needs the water. Uh, the stream is polluted. In the 23 years I've lived there, the town has not enforced its zoning in that area. There are storm water drains, wash machine drains, cellar drains, and even some drains from 77 going into that stream. I've seen it polluted over a long period of time. I'm one of the few people in town that has actually seen fish in Trout Brook. I've seen wildlife, I've seen ducks, I've seen beavers, I've seen otters, I've seen possums, and in the past five years I haven't seen anything. It's dead. And I believe the town is at fault. And when they do enforce the zoning, they enforce it very inconsistently, and I'll offer you this fact. There is much building going on in Queen Anne's Park, State Ave. All the backyards border on Trout Brook as mine does. I have approximately 250 to 300 feet of boundary. My lot is triangular, uh, depending on which plan you look at. There has been much building of additions, decks. Everybody's backyard in the 23 years I've lived here has been clear cut, and the land has been filled in. Everybody dumps their yard waste along the stream beds. There's never been any enforcement. In the past week, Two more lots were clear-cut. When I say clear-cut, I'm talking 40-foot spruce trees. One landowner even built a fire pit in his backyard to burn all the wood. He's also built a rock wall across the stream to dam it up to build a little farm pond in his backyard. And it's very inconsistent enforcement of zoning because a year and a half ago, I approached the town about making modest architectural adjustments to my house and a small addition. The small addition was for live-in staff to take care of the two disabled people that now live in the house, and the architectural adjustments would allow for first floor living for those two people to live. And I've been told I cannot do it because of the Trout Brook zone. So I'm, that's the bad news. Let me give you the good news. The town can have any easement or quick claim deed they want to my land if it means improving the Trout Brook sanctuary, mainly because the town, the property now has no value to me as I'm now forced by the inconsistencies of the town of Cape Elizabeth's enforcement of zoning to leave town. I can't live in my house anymore. It's just physically impossible. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments on this topic? be very short. I think uh, we just heard a really good example of the problems we have. We can't hear you, I'm sorry. Okay. I think we just heard a really good example of the problems we have. Um, if we haven't been doing it right as a town in the past, I don't see it being done right as a town in the future. Um, that's one comment. The other is we spend millions and millions for school, so I can't get too riled up about 100000 for stormwater. Um, not that I don't think we should put the money into schools, it's just not that big a part of the budget and I don't, think, don't see why we couldn't do a better job for this fellow and other residents who live near streams. 
Um, and I should also say that I think Maureen has a really hard job and she's doing a good job. And you all are doing a really good job. And uh, uh, I've learned a lot tonight. It's been very educational. And thank you for your time. Thanks. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Any other comments? Nobody? I hereby close the public hearing on the Trout Brook Watershed Community Utilization Plan. We will move on to item number 136. Do we have a motion? Go ahead, Tim. Oh, do we need to move to table the trap item 136? I believe we do. Okay, so I've moved that we table um, item 136 until I, the November 5th um, meeting, consistent with Mary Ann's motion with respect to item 135. Second. David? Okay, all in favor? Did I miss you last time, Ken? Huh? Did I miss you last time? No, I would, I would just like to see the date moved up. Come on. Yeah, I agree. Up which way? Forward. To, to October. October. Possible to change? It's I, I don't well, know. he voted Slowly. on the prevailing slide, so he can. Yeah. He can All right. uh, remove the question, right? He voted on the prevailing side. Yeah, the council can reconsider any motion uh, by nice. anyone who votes on the prevailing side, if that person chooses to. Is, is there somebody who? I'd ask that you reconsider it under the circumstances that the developer is under. Needs a second. Yeah. Anyone can say. Yeah. Yeah. In favor, uh, Jim. But you, which one, did you vote in favor of the first? Mm -hmm. First table? I did, but I hadn't heard the, the testimony from the developer at right. that point. Are you asking, are you making a motion to reconsider that first, uh, the adoption of the? Of the Trout Brook watershed right, right now. Just Trout Brook. Just Trout so Brook. item 136. 136, yeah. the one we're on. Okay. You, the one we just voted, 136. Mm -hmm. You can't do it because you voted against it. No. Right? Yeah. You can do it because you voted on the no, he wasn't on the 136, he wasn't on the prevailing side. 136, he voted him. Oh, right. Jim, if you want to bring 135, you can do that. But uh, the reason we brought it up was for 136. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I don't really have an interest in 135. It's the same issue. But somebody else may want to. Does anybody else? Next time. After. No. I'll do it as a courtesy. I don't know if I'll vote for it, but I'll uh, ask that we reconsider item 136. That's courtesy to Jim. I'll second that. We have a second. Yeah, vote. Okay, we're reconsidering. Okay, all in favor of reconsidering. That's the motion. Okay, I'll reconsider. Okay, so now we have four. Okay, so now it's back on the table, Jim. I would like. Now we need a motion. <laughs> I would move that we table discussion on item number 136 until October 8th. 10th. 10th. Okay, I will second your motion. Could, oh. could I ask? Yes. Discuss? Oh, wait a minute. It's tabling. Yeah, tabling. I can't ask. Okay. It's on. Uh, now it's, it's. I know, but I. Yes. <laughs> so. Because it seemed from the discussion that, that they needed to have a decision well, in a month or two. And I All right. 136 is, is being reconsidered. We've had a, a, a motion and a second. Then move to table, which is not debatable. And that's what we right. for Okay. All we in favor of, of moving the table to uh, October 10th. On that motion, no. Three, four. No, no, right. no three, three. In, in favor. <laughs> All opposed. Okay, so now it's, it stays in November. Hey, well, no, well, now we you need another motion, well, and so I'll move to table <laughs> it to November. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor. Like a special meeting. Okay. All right. It's, it's in November, but thanks for the effort. <laughs> okay. Um, let's move on to item number 137, sign ordinance. We have a motion on this. Oh, Jim, please. Okay. Um, would you like a motion for us? Like would. Background? Yeah, let's do a motion. Well, we can get a background. If, if you'd like to give some background, <laughs> go ahead. We'll start okay. with that. Uh, I'd like to give a brief summary of, of what went on at the meeting, and also at the end, I'd like to give a little editorial comment if you would allow me. 
As directed by the Town Council, the Ordinance Committee met on uh, Monday, August 27th to review the town's sign ordinance. We began with a brief discussion uh, on perceived problems with signage in town, regardless of the relevance to the current sign ordinance. We actually came up with a pretty substantial list of items, and I'll just dance down through these real quickly. Uh, temporary real estate signs, temporary construction signs, political campaign signs, isolated overuse of yard garage sale signs, signs for fish farm stands and pick your own operations under the uh, pre context that uh, current rules may be too restrictive, uh, failure of sports booster groups to remove signs following events, non conforming grandfathered signs at gas filling stations, uh, special events signs, signs on town owned property exclusive of the public way. Advertising signs on temporary structures and consistent ordinance enforcement, which uh, parenthetically is a challenge for most communities. We then related the above discussion and items to the current ordinance and decided that most, if not all, were addressed in some fashion already, so we didn't feel a need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we then reviewed the existing ordinance section by section and achieved uh, consensus support for our recommendations, which uh, you have in your packets, and I'll just review these briefly for the public. Uh, the substantive proposals that we are recommending include uh, adding, a dish, adding a definition for permanent signs to the definition section at the beginning of the ordinance, limiting the number of times per year to three that on and off premises yard garage sale signs may be posted for sales that are either conducted by the same people or are held at the same location, allowing pick your own operations to post off-premises signs for the duration of the picking season, adding the term, quote, home business, end quote, to the provision that addresses signage for, quote, home occupation, end quote, recognizing that there are subtle differences between these two terms. Uh, in the section dealing with the town center zone and the various business zones, we would reference the business signs tables at the end of the ordinance as, ordinance, uh, as Appendix A. We would change the current reference to the ordinance from the BOCA code to the IRC and IR, IBC codes. This reflects reference to the international construction codes that we're currently operating under in town and also the current codes that uh, are being used statewide, nationwide, and even uh, around the world. Uh, we would add a provision that the town shall have no responsibility or liability re regarding signs that are confiscated due to uh, violation of the ordinance. And we would broaden slightly the definition of those who are empowered uh, with enforcement authority. Uh, in addition, the Ordinance Committee also recommends three items for further consideration before we propose uh, new amendments to the ordinance. First, we recommend that the town, town council workshop time be devoted to discussion of signs at gas filling stations, uh, particularly those signs that might be non-conforming and that may or may not enjoy uh, grandfathered status. Second, we recognize the need to work closely with the operators of farms, far, fish farm stands, pick your own operations and related businesses. We therefore recommend uh, that once the proposed committee that will be in charge of exploring farm related issues is up and running, that signs be part of those discussions and that the recommendation, recommendations be submitted from that committee back to the Ordinance Committee for further review. And lastly, we recognize that some of the problems that exist with signs in town are probably due to a lack of public, ed public education regarding our sign ordinance. We therefore recommend that the town be authorized to notify habitual and or likely transgressors through an advisory letter. Letter recipient recipients might include real estate firms, construction firms, athletic booster groups, special event sponsors, political candidates, and so forth. So that's pretty much what came out of the meeting. The editorial comment that I would make is uh, I mentioned the limiting the number of times per year to three that on and off premises uh, yard and garage sale signs may be posted. Uh, that appears later in our agenda in item number 139, and as a result of how uh, 139 plays out, this may, have, may be a moot point. That's Thank you. That's a really good job. You guys did a really dang up job. Covered everything. Do we have a motion on this um, item? Would someone like to make a motion, Jim? I would move that we adopt uh, the proposed amendments to the signed ordinance as they appear in your packets this evening. We have a second. Need a public hearing. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Right. Move it to a public. We have to move to public hearing. I move to refer the proposed amendments that appear in your packets tonight to a public hearing 
uh, on October 10th. October 10th. Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Very good. Okay. Item number 138, agricultural profile. Someone like to make a motion? Or they, uh, you want to I want to do a brief introduction since I imagine there might be some folks here interested in this item. The town council at a workshop on June 29th looked at uh, suggested that we develop something called an agricultural profile using a committee. It came to the July council meeting and it was then put off to tonight's meeting. Uh, as originally discussed at the June 29th meeting, it was discussed that you know an awful lot of time would have to be spent to do this agricultural profile. And there were, there were specific recommendations to consultants. If that recommendation was carried out as discussed on June 27th, the estimated cost is about $20,000 to carry that out, if it was carried out the way that, that was discussed June 27th. It's, it's my recommendation that we not continue to keep funding studies, continue to keep spending money during the fiscal year. We, we just saw with the Portland School Committee that the council adopted a budget uh, that reduced the school budget and they went off spending money regardless of what the budget cut. The council imposed a, a municipal spending limit with a 2.47 percent spending increase this year. Uh, you know, it's everything is, as I said earlier, the other item. Everyone wants to do everything, but at the same time, what a majority of the council wanted most of all was to keep to a pledge that they had made to stay within certain spending limits. So, you know, this can be done more with volunteers. Uh, you could strike the, the amount uh, of the budget for it and, be, and still be done with volunteers, could still continue, and I, I know there's some offers and I'll let those come out. Uh, but I, I can't recommend that this be done with a, with a $20,000 appropriation uh, because of my concern with what happened in Portland and my concern, you know, just today, the, the facilities manager said that if the energy price stays where it is today, at the proposed walk-in price today, we would spend forty more thousand dollars for energy this year, school and town, than has been budgeted. Uh, and you know, and we also see a lot of weakening in the real estate market that brings in revenue. We see weakening in the building permit market. We see uh, excise taxes, you know, holding their own, but barely. Uh, it's uh, we could be in for a rough year economically. Uh, so, you know, if you'd like to do this, fine, but I, I think it would need to be done with very little staff assistance. Maureen would be the staff person otherwise, and Maureen is, is buried with other assignments we've already given her. Uh, so if you'd like to do this, I suggest you do it on a, I think as was suggested by Penny uh, Jordan, uh, with, you know, there's a lot of good volunteers out there in Cape Elizabeth, and do it more on a volunteer basis and start it that way. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I, what, what I'm really concerned about here is the urgency that was expressed by the, the farmers and the, and the fishermen to get something on the table. And I can appreciate what Mike says about the budgetary uh, constraints. And what I would like to offer as, a, as an alternative to the, the proposal that was made in our agenda tonight, rather than a top-down approach to take a bottom-up approach, a ground-up approach, if you want to make it a pun, talking about farmers, but um, what I'd like to see is, is a collaboration of the, of the farmers and fishermen in town get together as a group. I don't know, Penny, is there still a, an active grange around, a local grange? I don't know if it is, but I don't know. Okay. Um, but a collaboration of the, the in-town farmers and fishermen, uh, possibly with a, an assignment of a town councilor to provide process support and to, to ensure that the, the various actions are, are fairly represented on the committee and to go through a, an exercise of discussions as to what the issues are first I think Penny mentioned several of the issues to us tonight but the, there may be others from from other farmers and fishermen and so forth find out what the issues are find out what issues are affected by policy and ordinance what things the town can do to make things a little more amenable to the farming industry in particular and also to the fishermen in town um, it seems to me this could be done on a shoestring. Uh, we don't need st a lot of staff, you know, uh, 
uh, involvement, at least on, up, up front. I think we can do this. And, and what it does, it, it, it puts the farmers and the fishermen in charge of the pace. If they want to have five meetings a week for two weeks to get this thing done and move it right along, then, then why not? If they can come up with some proposals that we can consider, um, that I think would help address some of the urgency that they've conveyed. Um, that's just my feeling. I, do, you want, do you want to make a motion? Well, I'd, I'd first like to hear some other discussion to see if other people are on board with that, I think, just to get a, a feeling. Anybody have any ideas? That? I think it's a great idea. I'll, I'll support that. Penny, could I ask you, is that something that, that, that you might be, be happy with buying into, you know, uh, to, to, get go, to get things rolling? Yeah, and I know that Frank Sherrill talked about that in the past. Yeah. It's really, you know, bringing, bringing the people together. Yeah. I like that bottom-up approach. And I, I really think involvement on the part of a um, council person uh, it makes a lot of sense. I wouldn't have brought it up if I weren't willing to volunteer, so. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good guy. He doesn't volunteer other people. All right. Well, I, I guess I would like to make a motion that we, I don't know if we need to authorize a, a, a committee. We're not naming the committee. We're, we're allowing the, the fishers, fishermen and farmers to get together. Uh, I guess we that could we allow, would be that we'd be interested in hearing from such a committee as soon as they want to get up and running and, and come to us with some proposals. So. And I would just um, suggest that it, it not be limited to one counselor, that if you let us know when your meetings are, you may find that more than one counselor is able and willing and interested and, and okay. like wanting. We've got to get more clarity here, but I, I like what you're doing. I think we need one counselor to be the convener and the liaison, That's fine. Yeah. even though all seven of you may wish to participate. Otherwise, it could be directionless. Yeah. And, uh, I agree. Why don't we as say far that? as the liaison. And I think down. it's great that Jim's volunteered for that. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. But some of us may also <laughs> want to just go. So, Jim, what you're proposing, you're, the way I understand your, your, uh, I don't know if I your, uh, <laughs> your uh, motion here, is that you, you're making a motion that we establish an Agricultural Profile Committee. Well, I don't know. Surprised it's not an Agricultural Profile Committee. I don't think. No? I don't think we want to get that technical. I think All we right. want to get some uh, a work group, a discussion group. That we would be interested. How about something like it? the council would express an interest in hearing from a citizens' work group on committee. this agricultural is issue, okay. and that one councilor would be will, Jim would be willing to participate as a facil facilitator. Okay, do we have a Can we even just one? go farther and, and name Jim specifically yeah. as our liaison oh, to that group? Volunteered. <laughs> okay, that's fine. And do we have a second? I mean a second on that? Yes. Second. second. All right. Second. And any other discussion? Just a quick we, comment. We've got, okay. I know, just a quick comment. I would just offer, and um, there was a mention that you believe there's some resources at the state level, and to the extent that I can help facilitate that, I'm available. Excellent. Okay, all in favor? Okay, everybody. I, I don't mean to cut you off at all, but um, I'll, I'll, no, I didn't. <laughs> but we do have to get going because it seems like every item takes a lot longer than it normally would, or than I thought it might. Okay, item number 139. Well, but it's mostly land trust. Can I introduce this, please? Yeah, Carl Dietrich, who, who, who was here this evening, uh, has proposed to the town council uh, that you look into an ordinance limiting the number of yard sales held by a resident per year. Uh, this would require an amendment to the zoning ordinance. An amendment to the zoning ordinance before it being considered by the council needs to be referred to the planning board. I, I'm not sure if Mr. Diedrich heard, but under the signed ordinance, there already is a proposal that will be a public hearing next month that they'll be, they're allowed to put up signs no more than three times per year for a yard sale. So we will begin to address this concern, but maybe the planning board also might like to look at it in terms of what it really gets back to. And we have one resident at least that has about 17, what's the latest count? 16. 16 garage sales so far this year. 
and you know some of the neighbors aren't exactly thrilled with that, and uh, it's uh, it's it, you know it's a problem. And it, at least the the sign ordinance provision would at least allow us to go to that resident and say you've had your three times. One of the challenges with the, the ordinances, and as Mr. Diedrich pointed out in the handout here, uh, Diedrich in the, the handout here today, is you know to set up a a lot of cities and towns have you know permit fees and a whole bureaucratic and he doesn't want that maybe the sign ordinance provision will will partially do that as long as people notify us you know that we, you know on, on those whether the problems of you know the sign was up on this state this state and this state so that we can then send a letter to that person saying that that you're done and and you know if the sign ordinance passed we'll be notifying that person as well or even even over the next month before the public hearing that you know the the, the day of uh, the error of having 16 garage sales in 10 months is, uh, might be short-lived. So. Thanks, Mike. Would someone like to make a motion? Cynthia. Well, I would move that we refer this item to the planning board um, to consider a possible amendment to the zoning ordinance. We have a second. Second. Mary Ann, need a discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Um, item number 140. I move that we receive um, the report of the sewer rehabilitation project. Do we have a second? Second. Sir, any discussion? All in favor? Okay, now we're moving. <laughs> Can we, I, I guess I, I should have said something because I wanted to. Uh, it's just an amazing amount of work. And, uh, yeah. Um, those of us who have been on the council for a couple of years have watched it, and um, I just want to make sure that we um, convey our thanks to the manager and ask him to convey our thanks to all the public works folks because it really has been a lot of work and a challenge and didn't want it to go unmentioned. Thanks, Mary. It's, it's been a very good cooperative relationship between the town staff, particularly Bob Malley, uh, the uh, town engineers led by uh, Steve Harding at Oast, as well as the contractors and particularly the residents. They put up with a lot of, uh, uh, lot of stuff uh, for two and a half years and uh, really appreciate their assistance, the easements they granted, the other, the other actions uh, that occurred over the period. Uh, the DEP helped us as well on the, uh, with the State Revolving Loan Fund. Yeah, and th those areas are looking really nice that have been rehabbed. Yeah, we gave, we still gave Dearborn, though, a list of, I think, 29 lawns in Elizabeth Park that we want fixed. So <laughs> <laughs> you get the final report, but the project continues. <laughs> okay, item 141. Do you want to say anything? You got the agenda, right? I do, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, oh, um, tax abatement? Yes. Did you, yeah, Matt Sturgis uh, recently was working with a, a Roberta and Julian Barber of two Cantor Lane and they had bought some of the Chinquette land on Cantor Lane and the acreage that Matt was carrying the old acreage of the full parcel rather than the new acreage of the smaller parcel and he made an abatement for the current year only the council can grant an abatement for the previous year under the state law and that would uh, he recommends the the granting of the abatement and the refund would be three hundred eighty nine dollars and forty cents in taxes uh, for the uh, fiscal year 2006-2007. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? All right. Now 142. <laughs> this is an easy one. <laughs> Cynthia. <laughs> it is my great honor to move that Councillor Ann E. Swift Teata be Cape Elizabeth's voting delegate to the Maine Municipal Association Convention. You need an alternate too, just in case. I'll, I'll do it. Good. So moved. Okay, second. <laughs> do we have a second? Oh, right. Second. Second from Mary Ann. And uh, any discussion? All in favor? All right. Thank so, you very much. This is welcome. It's real, right. You didn't. You wouldn't have known where to look, but we'll pass around a, a copy for you to sign. Oh, we'll fill in the names. Oh, do you have the original? Yes, I do. Oh, good. If you could pass around that sheet, it'd be sure, great. Well, shall we start? Sure. Okay. Well. Item number 143. Michael. Yeah, this, uh, these folks very much would like to purchase U3-2 
92. Uh, Mark Bryken uh, did see my recommendation on the website. We now have posted all the backup items. Needless to say, he wasn't very happy with the recommendation. Uh, but he, he would still like us to begin the process. He indicated he might be willing to offer uh, more than the 15000 uh, My recommendation stands up. I had a couple questions. Yes. On the property. Um, are they abutters to the, this lot? They are. They are abutters. And is this lot separately of a buildable size, or are they just trying to enlarge their backyard? They've indicated to me that they're trying to protect themselves, that they're worried that the town might try to put an affordable housing unit on there. Discussion a couple years ago of possibly reducing below 10,000 uh, the available lot, uh, the available size that a, that a, uh, a lot might go in. And it, it, it is correct that the Conservation Commission did not request that this be a lot that we retain? Yeah, back in 2004, the town council was on a, on a uh, mission uh, <laughs> and had a goal to look at all the lands we owned and to try to get rid of what we didn't need. Uh, the, the council proceeded to sell, the town proceeded, I don't mean to blame the council, uh, proceeded to sell a couple of lots and like, like a lot of things, it was a backlash. Uh, and uh, then the council adopted this long policy of how we dispose of land that goes on for about four to five pages, and we need to review it with, with everyone, send letters to all the neighbors and whatever, and, you know, my sense is if we go through that process, you know, we'll get pretty strong opposition from many quarters, and my guess is you won't, you'd vote not to sell it, but, you know, you can still run it through the process if you'd like. Well you know, I, th I think if it's someone who's just looking to expand their yard and it's not land that the Conservation Commission says has value to us, and so we can enhance our tax base without further development, we can get this land back on the tax rolls, um, I think it's worth pursuing. I don't think they've made a reasonable offer. Um, but I think that we ought to put it through our process and let it go a little further and see what happens. I wouldn't feel that way if I thought they wanted to build a lot, build a house on it. But. Oops. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, yeah, I need back to back <laughs> Here comes the bad question. I think I missed the answer to this, Mike. I'm sorry. I was busy. My answer was just. Is it a buildable lot? I never answer that question. Well, no. And the town, the size the town policy is never to answer that question uh, after the, the Trundy Point case. What is the minimum size? This It's, it's 10,000 in a sewer area, and this is less than 10,000. This is less than 10,000. So it's not right now legally a buildable lot. <laughs> He's not answering. <laughs> Okay. Well, so it's okay. And but we so try to avoid answering those my questions. Second, my second Less question. Let's the specific plan. My second question is your uh, object, your recommendation that the offer be re rejected. Is it because you think the offer is too low, or is it, or is it because you think the offer is too low? I mean, I, if they'd offered fifty-five thousand nine hundred, would you be still recommending? I had no indication that they were going to offer anywhere near that in my conversation okay. uh, with the gentleman. Uh, yeah. Then I'll withdraw my motion. You know, it, yeah. uh, you know maybe you might worth like worth to do this. Wasting. Okay, I'll Ooh, withdraw my motion. Maybe you'd like to do it, but with some indication that there'd be a minimum based on a confirmation that, that, the, that there's interest with a minimum bid of X amount. Uh, yeah. Well, we ought to go into executive session if we're discussing the sale of land. I would just withdraw my motion at this point. That's fine. So what is the motion? Do we have a motion here? Then, then I'd like to make the motion that we accept the manager's recommendation that we do not refer this for a, few, a, a full municipal review. And my reason for that is I don't think it's a reasonable offer. Okay. 
I don't want to characterize that as the manager's reason, but my reason. Is that. Do we have a second on that motion? Second. Sarah. Okay, any discussion? One question. Yes. You, you, your motion, Councillor Swift, had is said because it's not a reasonable offer. Uh, you know, if they came back, if they asked, well, what if we came back with another offer? Could we get this on the council agenda? My response would be, under council rules, the council can only discuss something once each year, so they could come back with a reasonable offer, but they'd need to come back for it after December 1st, which is a new council year. Or we could suspend the rules. Or you could suspend the yeah. rules. Yeah, that, that's the out. Okay. So. I just want to make sure I'm giving a clear answer. Back. And as a point of further discussion, to the extent that that conversation takes place, I would be inclined to suggest that a reasonable offer is no less than assessed value. Yes. In fact, I should think it should be well above it, as houses generally sell that way and land. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I a lot of under 10,000 square feet would be getting premium prices, but I agree with Councillor Back well, that assessed. if it's assessed at 55.9. I think this is a discussion at this point that we yeah. would be right. better off in executive I, session I'll and we're right. way you're right the card is right I think your That's point is right. well so the made the discussion David. is it's already a motion on the floor I know there is but we're discussing that motion that's where it started <laughs> <laughs> it just all right so um, at this point anybody else any comments on the motion that's been made the motion is that we reject the offer yeah, my motion is that we accept the manager's recommendation that the offer be rejected and not ref be referred to the Conservation Commission for a f and for a few full municipal review. All right, so we did. Very good. Okay, we've had discussion. All in favor of the motion? Thank you. Okay, let's go to citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. We have no citizens in the room except for us, so well, that's not going to work. And do we have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. All in favor. Very good. Now the next town council meeting is on Wednesday, October 10th at 7.30 p.m. And the town council will have a workshop, which is open to the public clearly, um, tomorrow, September 11th, and then on September 17th, at, both at 7.30 p.m. The, the meeting tomorrow night, by the way, is I think is going to be in the small room downstairs outside the technology, the old cafeteria, we call it. The school board's meeting in here, and we like to leave that room open for an executive is session. We're, down, we're downstairs. Yeah, it's downstairs here. Okay. Inside the technology office. Yeah, we got the